Welcome to Diffuse Congruence, the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined by our co-host, Omar Ansari. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, glad to be here in Skokie, Illinois. As our trip in Chicagoland continues, it's been fun so far, and I'm also looking forward to today's conversation. Yes, sir. I am been looking forward to this conversation. In fact, this conversation affords me an opportunity to reconnect with a very old and dear friend, and that would be, Omar, if you can do the honors. We're here with Habib Qadri. Habib is an educator, author, and youth activist. He's been in education for over 25 years as a teacher, principal, and superintendent of MCC Academy, which we'll definitely be talking and about. And which is where we're sitting. That's right. We are in MCC Academy, <laughs> at least one of the one of the facilities. Um, in August of 2019, Habib was awarded the National Distinguished Principal Award by the National Association of Elementary School Principals, NAESP, the village of Morton Grove, and Skokie, awarding him with a Habib Qadri Day for his work in the community and education. He's currently appointed at the Harvard University Graduate School of Education Principals Advisory Board, where he's part-time staff member in the Professional Development Program. Habib is also chairman of the Illinois Coalition of Non-Public Schools, ICNS, representing more than 2,000 private schools. In addition to teaching and administering in both public and private schools, he's delivered over 1,000 lectures throughout the U.S. and several countries abroad on leadership education, uh, and youth. In 2006, Habib founded High Quality Education Consulting, an education consulting company from which he's conducted workshops for the U.S. Uh, US Department of State, numerous local, national, and international schools and universities in, in countries around the world, including Kenya, Singapore, Pakistan, Canada, Qatar, and more. He's chair of the Muslim Youth of North America, the largest youth empowerment organization for Muslim youth. Uh, for all the work he's done in the Muslim community, he's also been awarded the Lifetime Educational Achievement Award by the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, and he's co-authored five books and written dozens of articles on youth parenting and education. So we are super excited to have this conversation with uh, Habib Khadri. Welcome, Habib. Thank you for having us. You know, this is exciting to catch up with the old friend of mine. That's right. Yes, sir. I have the honor of knowing Habib for three decades. I don't want to date us in three decades. And special shout out actually to Mujtaba Ghosbai, who actually reconnected us because, you know, as things go, you know, you lose touch with people that were once very close to you and your paths don't always cross. And I realized that I don't have Habib's contact information anymore. So I reached out to Mujtaba Bhai, who I know is a listener, which is why I wanted to give him a shout out and your brother-in-law Habib. So you probably definitely want to give him a shout out. <laughs> <It's> my big <laughs> brother. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But thank you so much. And uh, yeah, so Habib, it's great to be sitting across from you again and uh, of all places in Skokie because uh, we share a lot of mem memories here. I was sitting with Sheikh Amin and I was telling Sheikh Amin the first time I ever met him, came across him was, I think I was either dragged by you yes. or, it was probably you, or Azu, mm -hmm. Azar Osman, um, to a boys' halakha that he would do at MEC, See, Muslim correct. Educational Center, right here in, in Skokie. Are we? Yeah, in Morton Grove, yeah. It's, Morton, it's, Morton it's, Grove, okay. Our, our original campus. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. And uh, right. I was telling him how I had never been exposed to that sort of uh, level of scholarship in my life, or to date, you know, and oh. so it just sort of blew my mind. And uh Years later, I would have the opportunity to reconnect with him and study with him. So, been very blessed. But uh, and anyway, so great to see you again, bro. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, brother. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize this, but you know, when, when we talk about Mina Muslim Youth in North, North, North America, one, I'm glad to see its resurgence and the fact that you're still actively mm -hmm. involved with it. You know, Mina was a uh, indelible part of my growing up, and you know, that's how I got to meet so many people that I'm still very close to and people that I, who have gone on to great things like yourself. So Minna connected us and frequent trips to Chicago and the Midwest and Isna would uh, give us opportunities to reconnect. So uh, anyway, it's just been great. And uh, anyway, I, I remember one of the highlights of Minna camps or just Minna or Isna uh, conventions. A lot of people may not know this, but the comedy duo of the 1990s <laughs> was Habib Qadri and Azar Osman. It was like the uh, Abbott yeah. and Costello <laughs> of, 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 of our day and age. That's right. That's Are right. Are you and Azu? You still get a chance to see Azu? Yeah, you know, yeah, now, now he's been quite busy. Yeah. So, but we kind of still try to touch, you know, touch base maybe yeah. uh, once a year because right. now he's not living here that much. Entirely, right? Yeah. yeah. But, but, but it's great. Yeah. No, he, yeah, when we were young, there was quite a bit. And then it was, it was a kind of funny about, about, story about this is that in college, he started taking stand up and he's like, hey, why don't you do it with me? Yeah. Right. And I, I really wanted to do improv. Okay. And I, you know, I, I, you know, I was like, hey, you know, Bob, I'm going to do this. And he's like, what? 
you want to be a jokester? You want to be an educator, right? So I was like, well, you know what I mean? What I teach, I want to become fun. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my still skill sets, right? But it was something I wanted to pursue. Uh, but, you know, and it's just kind of like that balance. But then, you know, I'm so excited that other kind of yeah. kept going, mashallah. That's well, right. You know, it's it's as a parent, it's hard connecting with youngsters, the youth, <laughs> the youth, or whatever you whatever you know. What's uh, kids these days? Um, I think comedy and connection go a long way. So I'm sure I'm sure that comes into play each and every day I, I, as you go into work and work with uh, young kids. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's really helped me because I use on Friday I dress up, oh, so yeah? I have outfits every Friday. I have a different, you know, different kind of hats, costumes, Batman, you know. So yeah. and I use that as a way to kind of joke around with kids and get to you know get you know to hang out with them. And it was crazy because when I first did this, you know, I came from public school. So I came to Islamic school. You had like seven principals in the first last four in you know, the first 14 years of the school yeah which is wow. had so they're turnover. like turnover yeah turnover yeah. right and so when i first got there so you know i was like you know, i'm gonna do this on fridays and so you know kids would you know you know joke around you make them laugh but through time they're gonna be like oh that's a silly principle right so yeah. so teachers would be like i mean the parents would be you know brother you know and it's so awesome that you do this but you know don't you want them to have that respect for you because when we were back home like you have to realize this yeah. is 2002 so a lot of our parents were Still. back home parents so they're like you know the prince, you know, when we saw the principal, we'd stand straight, we'd look down, we would be too scared to even look at the principal, right? We had that so much fear for them and right. that respect. Like, we wouldn't even want to look at the classroom or the, the, uh, the principal's office. Yeah. And I told them, I said, look, well, I don't want them to be, you know, lo- you, know uh, you know, respect me out of fear. I want them to respect me out of love. Mm. I want to be like, I don't want to disappoint Mr. Fadri, right? And I said, look, and I was like, my, my teachers are not uh, how our culture showed what leadership is. I want what the prophet, the prophet some, when you heard about the prophet, they didn't say, when the prophet walked around, people walked away yeah. and they put their heads down and said, can't look at him. They would want to be by him. The kids want to be by him. The adults wanted to be by him. And so that was one of my big things is that when I was a young kid, a lot of the ulama, right, you know, just want to go shake their hands. It would be like, barely you could touch their fingers, right? So I was just like, nah, I'm going to change that game, right? Great and, reminder, great yeah. reminder that, hey, at the end of the day, we have a, Example, I was in the prophet. So I was literally just saying today we were talking about like masculine, feminine, like archetypes, you know, arch- archetypes with, this, with the movie, the, the Bar- uh, Barbie movie yeah, out, yeah. right? It's like on one hand, it's pitching feminism. On the other hand, there's masculinity. And we're not going to talk about all that. But, you know, there's there's two extremes in, in our culture. And at the end of the day, if you look at the prophet, so awesome. that's like actually the perfect middle, uh, mm-hmm. even in that topic. But you're talking about how how to be a, a, a leader in a school environment, right? right yeah. And that's that's just yet another example of how that's an example of moderation there. So, so take us back, Habib. I mean, you know, picking up the story, I guess, where where, where you and I sort of leave off. Uh, I think you were at UIC, mm-hmm. right? You were at yes, University, yes. Uh, University of Illinois at Chicago, Circle Campus. Is, did they yeah. still call it Circle yeah, Campus? Yeah, University of Illinois at Chicago, yeah. 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 But they still call it like the, you know, gotcha, the student gotcha. union. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because it's funny, because growing up, my dad used to call it this. He still used to refer to it as the Circle <laughs> the Campus. Because I think in the 60s and 70s, that was sort of like the thing the, to yeah, call it. Yes. Um, but anyway. Was, um, your, was for business, was your dad? My dad, actually, yeah. So Chicago means, and it has a lot of special um, place in my heart, because my father first immigrated to Chicago, and he came here in 1969. Okay. And uh, yeah, and eventually would obviously resettle after completing his entire career and uh you know, Ardin Tamuth also, where he would, uh, you know, uh, find his demise and, and lays to rest. So, uh, Allah Yarham. So, it's just, it's, it's fascinating. So, Chicago always has that place. Uh, Chicago, a Sharif, yeah. uh, as, as is the common <laughs> sort of expression. But, yeah, it was a, it was a magnet for, I think, uh, Indian Pakistanis, certainly Hyderabadis. Uh, and I'm yes. sitting across from two. <laughs> uh, Heather bodies, or at least immigrant Heather bodies. So, yeah, take us back. So, you were at UIC. You, uh, you, you knew you wanted to be an educator. Yes. How, how far back do you think you knew you wanted to be a teacher? And it must have been, if you did know early, that there was probably a teacher in your life that had that impact. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing because, so my parents both taught Sunday school, right? So he, my dad came here in 1960, came to Chicago in oh, 1966. Sure. Really? So the first Sunday school used to be in Gary, Indiana. They used to take a bus, you know, so there's like six people. My dad, my mom was a teacher, like high uncle, yeah. there's like a, several, like I've been kind of, kind of trying to find out all this information. Yeah. So... So, you know, they were Sunday school. My mom's still teaching Sunday school for 51 years. So, so alhamdulillah, you know what I mean? And then, so, I used to complain about Sunday school, right? You know, Azu, all of them were all in the same class, right? And my father said, look, we're trying our best. Yeah. So, why don't you do something? So, when I graduated, I was 14, mm. you know, like, you know, going to ninth grade. Right. I started teaching first graders. 
right? And oh, second, nice. and then kind of had that. It was probably the youth group, you know, yeah, so I was, yeah. I was working with youth. That's right. And subhanAllah, my parents both were very supportive of me going into the field. Okay. It's like, look, you know what? You know, I still remember my father said, bring back the nobility in that field, mm. right? He mm. goes, you know, uh, if, you know, bring back the nobility of this noble profession. And he goes, you know, I really want you to go ahead and do that. My mom was first like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe not. But, you know, subhanAllah, you know, Allah, you know, my mother's dua was that become an alim. Right? Oh, so that's what she wanted me to be. Yeah. So I was like, well, uh, you know, because, you know, they even tried to, in the eighth grade, send me back home. Oh, wow. And I was like, no, 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 I got to play ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, I'm going to play basketball. You know, I was like, I, you know, I'll do this on the side. I'll take some classes. I'll hop in some means classes. Shake a means classes yeah. back in 13, 14. I was like, I, I'm not going, you know, <laughs> overseas. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I was like, good challenge. So, but, you know, for the field. So education, yeah. just working with kids, you know, educating kids. And, and it just kind of trickled effect. So even when I got to college, you know, I worked in, in a Caribbean Green Project Education Plus. Really? Worked with the inner city kids. So, wow. so a lot of my kind of work, you know, it's Future Teachers of Chicago, you know, mm -hmm. and the, at UIC's, there was a club. So a lot of it, it was kind of like, I'm going to do this. There was this kind of back and forth. Should I? Should I not? What's people going to think? You mm -hmm. know? And, and, you know, but my dad says, like, you're going to do it. You have to strive to be the best, right? So, like, one of our models at our school is, like, do your best. Allah will take care of the rest. Because, yeah. like, if you're going in this field, you don't want people to think, like, hey, he had no other option. You know, that's what a, you know, community activist, right? He's just going to do the bare minimum, right? So, one of the big keys, I think, it was my folks really saying, you know, you know, if you're going to go, go all out, right? right. So And your, yeah. your dad, you said 1960. That's, yes. like... One of the earliest. Oh yeah, yeah. he was at the first. You know, this year's the 60th anniversary of Isna, so he was at the 1963 Champagne meet. You know, wow, with everyone, like to 20, 30 people. Yeah, so really, he's like, he went to Oklahoma State for a year. Yeah, he was there. You know, and and you know, so he came here for further, further education. Yeah, like yeah, our yeah, book, yeah, yeah, yeah. He started there one year, and you know, he was telling me he's like, yeah, some of his classes, he would sit one side, all that, all the other students would sit on the other side, Caucasians. And after the next year, he found that Kansas State had. In state tuition, so he moved there. And but I was wondering how you all came to Chicago because they couldn't get jobs there, right? He's like, you could only maybe bus boy, like in Oklahoma State, when you want to get a haircut in some places, then you realize, oh, white's colored. I'm colored. Really? So and and then when he went to Kansas State, he ran for state uh, student senate, right? So he has all these things. So I'm like, well, you know, he kind of was like pushed the trailblazers. This idea of like, you know, never underestimate yourself, just do it. And so, but he used to they all used to come to Chicago because that's where you could get summer jobs. And they would go back there, try to live out the you know school year, come back here, earn some money, and earn some money. And then so when he even got graduated, it took him five years just to get an engineering j job. So that's why when he was in the city of Chicago, and I was like, Bobby, you stayed for thirty years, you never decided to branch out. He's like, it took me four years. I didn't realize, but I was one years old, and my sister was three, uh, four. She, they, he sent us back to India because it was like after a year or two, he couldn't find. He's like, just go there. Then finally found a city job. We all came back. Mm. right i was like thank god man i would have been like an idiot yeah, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know did he was he like a lifer with the city like he did yeah he did it yeah he did not leave right i thought so yeah, yeah yeah he just stayed and kind of like and i was asking him like why don't you ever take a chance and then i kind of heard the story yeah it's like yeah you didn't realize i was like man i was in wow. india for two years i was a little kid but one to two i was like and and so subhanallah so so that's where this whole thing of city so so that's where the msa's first headquarters in uh, uh gary that's so he used to drive there on the weekends. Wow. Six, seven brothers. My mom used to, you know, always go. And so that's where the first Sunday school started. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's this, this fascinating, just looking at, you know, there are just whole storylines. Because I was like, how from Hyderabad, India, do you go to, you know, find Oklahoma State still? I went there just to like finally visit, you know, just to be like, oh yeah. my God, how? It's yeah. like, even now I was feeling like, man, there's, you know, a comfortable, not so many minorities. Exactly. I'm thinking in the 60s. Crazy. That is crazy. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I mentioned my dad. So my after getting married, uh, he had already finished undergrad here in Chicago, went back home, got married to my mom. And they don't end up in Oklahoma, but they end up in Texas because my dad was going to grad school there. Wow. So they're in Odessa, Texas in 1973. <laughs> it's just crazy. You know, the other day we were driving in the car and my kids started asking my mom about like, what was that like? Like, yeah. you know, and you know, walking around in a sari in a grocery store, you know, and she remembers encountering her first like Indian, per you know, like a person from India and just how relieved she was to meet someone in a grocery store in Odessa, Texas. Yeah. Uh, and that auntie would go on to, be, you know, throw my mom her first baby shower, wow. you know, because that was the only auntie or they see that they knew in, in all of o yeah. uh, Odessa slash Midland. Yeah. So uh, that that generation, I don't think gets enough props in terms of what they yeah. did and sacrifice to be here and to come here and yeah. give us the life that we at times take took advantage of no i believe it and that's why i i think for us like you know when we complain about all oh, the community and this 
they did they they did their best. They're just trying to do whatever, right? Yeah. They just came here first, just trying to figure out education. Then they realized right. maybe I want to stay here. Then how do we make sure we take care of our kids, show that they have their identity, still have their faith, their culture? Right. And they just did whatever they knew. Mm-hmm. They knew that they weren't like no educators, but that was their their sacrifice and commitment, which you know you can never question that. So even for me, and in that field. Where my father, you know, I think, you know, my parents both were like, you know what, they're going to be everyone in this field, but this is something that you want. Even for me coming to Islamic schools, you know, I was in a public school, right? And I was coming back, you know. Did you go to public uh, growing up too, though? Yeah, I went to Chicago public schools. Okay. Right? And then, but in that whole thing of Chicago public schools, so even at Bon Steuben High School, right? So, Hamla, I realized, I think, when I was a young age, you know, like like sports, like, helped me, right? You You know, as a sophomore, I played varsity. I was the captain of the, you know, of a... A, t- a really solid high school program in the Chicago public schools, maybe one of the first Daisies, playing varsity as a sophomore year. So by junior year, we started the first Muslim club, right, in the whole United States, at least that we know, right? I mean, I'm Jed, and said, hey, let's have prayer. And one of my coaches and, and, and so on and so forth. That's why I have so much respect for that coach because my that coach yeah. came and spoke to my father and said, your son needs to play and travel with us. Before yeah. AAU was everything, yeah. back then there was only a few teams. And so we went to like Long Beach, Phoenix, Las Vegas, North Carolina. And I'm here with like me and like, you know, 11 like African American brothers, you know, who just, you know, I, I love it. It was just, it was just, it was just great. And it was funny because when we used to go, my father was like, no, no, no. Then he's like, okay, if you want him to go, he has to roommate with you to coach. I was like, what? So, and this is before cell phones, right? Kids about yeah. to understand this. <laughs> so six o'clock in the morning, my father would call the, the for fudger. Yeah. And then in the evening, he would call like, just to make sure I was at the hotel room, right? So like the first few cities, I had to stay with my, you know, with, with the coach. My coach was like, you know, he's like, do you think you can just kind of, you know, put, stay with the players? Then he would be like, I'm like, Baba, the coach wants us me to stay yeah. with the players. Right. But then he would be like, okay, I'm checking. You better not be going out evening, right? Because the coach would be like, look, just come back by 11, 30, 12. Yeah, that was great. I mean, can you keep an eye on everyone? <laughs> that was the coach's curfew, but you had your own curfew. <laughs> curfew, and, right. Uh, <laughs> and and for our listeners, road. Habib's a good uh, six, four, eight, four or something? No, like six, no. Six, five, six, six, five. Six, five. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, Bob's like five, two, so it's kind of crazy. Yeah. But yeah, so it was like, but your like dad a person is tall. Yeah, but yeah, my body at five, ten. Yeah, I'm a little funny. Yeah, so. Yeah, so I had that experience just working, yeah. kind mm-hmm. of faith, mm-hmm. you know, and kind of looking at those challenges. I think, right. uh, play, you know, sports and my parents kind of playing. So I kind of always working with others and be like a big brother in high school as a senior to a freshman. So that's where all the educational sure. working with others kind of came into play. And real quick, I know I know leadership is one of the areas you speak on. I've recently th- been thinking about the importance, the role of sports in shaping you, young folks not just like, hey, this is good exercise, but just in the discipline and all the other aspects that you get out of sports, the commitment. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if you want to just comment on that yeah. because it's probably been a p- big part of you know, who you are, right? Oh, it's, sports played the biggest part in my life. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. my dad was a tough guy. We didn't have TV. I would have to watch, you know, write down the channel, like Cosby show, 30 minutes. So, you know, he only let me watch games, right? We didn't have a VCR. I, I, my first VCR cable is when I got married. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I think he finally got one by my junior senior year when the Emily Dobb tapes were coming out or something. No, He's like, it took, that, message. <laughs> it took that, it took that to, to get oh approval. Oh my right? lord! Wow. And and so it, it was just kind of like you know this whole thing. So sports was my outlet, right? Right. Just my where because everything else was like you know your father's very involved in the community, so I always have to be like you know nice. So sports was my only outlet where I could just be like yeah. let it all out, right? You know, talk trash, you know, trash. Uh, young kids, please don't do that. <laughs> but but the idea of just kind of like. Uh, Gave me that opportunity to really just go ahead. And when I realized sports, so even for, like, my daughters both played high school ball. Like, you know, mm. she just graduated. She, she was the captain of her uh, public high school. Oh, but wow. when they were in middle Amazing. school, our, our daughters, their team went, we won the regional finals in the state of Illinois. So that, like, so we were on the news for the first uh, girls with hijab. Uh, WNBA invited them. Really? And then this year, mashallah, our, our two vo- volleyball teams won regionals. And we went to the sectionals in the state. So CBS News did a, a, on them. You know, so what sports is makes you confident of your faith yeah. too, and right because you're you're making dua, God help you. You're seeing, uh, you know, the ups and downs, and it gives you those opportunities, right? Because by high school, you're like the man, and by college, I was like, you know, humble, right? So you get these opportunities, and so for me, even our boys' basketball team this year went to the sectionals in the state, right? So, so and that brought school pride yeah. and being Muslim, and, and I feel like think about even my the the, the individuals I looked up to. Where you have the Muhammad Ali, the Kareem the Jabars, Hakeem Olajuwon, yeah. yep. and even the, like the Shuyuk, like who I really like, 
in Minna, it was like uh, Imam Siraj Hajj. And, and he used to be the guy like at the camps where we would play shoot baskets with you. That's right. Right? And, and that's he was where good. Like, he this played college. Like, yeah. I never you thought yourself. about sports being facilitating a relationship with, your, with Allah, right? right? I always thought about, hey, it's good for you from right. a discipline point of view. And then I also thought about, of course, yeah. the role models. Like, yeah. I mean, Hakeem Olajuwon for sure. Right. For anybody who's listened to the show knows I'm like, you know, the biggest, biggest yeah. fan. Um, but I never thought about that angle of like, yeah. hey, you're making dua and yeah. it's, con- it's actually connecting you directly. Talk and, a and, little more about that. And, and I, so because just the idea, like I, we've had games where, you know, we always make, before the game starts, you make your dua. Halftime, they're struggling, like, let's make dua. And like, they, they, see, a ch- they see like they win, right? And then sometimes it might, it might not work out. But the idea of realizing that, guess what? You get ibadah. Like, worship is not just salah, zakah. Like, I once asked the kids when I first came to Islam schools, anyone work weekend schools, right? What do you think is a, a good Muslim? Salah, zakah, som, hajj. A few weeks later, I asked, what's a good person? Smiling, kind, nice, caring. Wow. I said, smiling, kind, you, that's ibadah. Really? Like, you're playing sports and you don't cuss. You're getting good deeds. You play sports and you don't put someone back and you calm yourself, you're getting that you're getting worship, you're getting Jannah money, right? You're making dua before remembering God before your game, that's good deeds. You're getting hasanat for it. You're playing sports and just covering your knees because God wants you to do that, you're getting hasanat for it. I think when we don't when we start putting this stuff like only just a lot, again, when I'm saying this, we have to do your foundations. But these other character ideas and saying, hey, when you go to sleep and just make dua. Before you go to sleep the way Prophet did, you get hasanat for your sleep. You go to bathrooms to take with your left foot, say your du'a, you get good deeds for going to the bathroom. And I think when people don't realize, you look in the mirror and just say, mashallah, you get good deeds. And, I, and what I want you guys, a lot, people, kids to know is that Allah is trying to get us into Jannah. It's mm-hmm. small things, right? And the beauty of the Prophet was character. And that's why, you know, that starting when people are like, oh my God, you know, I'm like, when kids are going to shake their hands or just joke around, if I'm going to go out to the playground and shoot baskets with them, and joke around like we have a staff game every year. You know, 20 years we've never lost until this year. To you guys. <laughs> At least the only good part is I used to coach all these kids in their third, second grade. My son's in that, that game. That <laughs> I used to do. So I've had them since seventh grade. So finally, after 21 years, we finally lost a staff game and these boys. But the idea is that they've had that moment that a lot of them like, hey, you know, that sports is very important that we go to games. So we take sometimes our kids to games and then say, hey, at, at halftime, let's go pray Salah. And I want them to sh- show them it's okay. You can still pray Salah. And you know, when our uncles used to be like, stand up. Say the other, be proud of who you are, right? You got everyone praying, uncles, and we need some logs to write at the amusement park and all the guys in the back are looking around like, I know you can't see me, but like, oh my God, right? So I told them, I'm like, hey, you know what? We're going to go and play. Like we had a White Sox game. We went to Bulls game. Say, hey guys, 15 of you guys are going to pray. The other five, 10 are going to watch you, yeah, watch your backside. Right. That way security comes, we got you. So don't worry about that. That's right. Right? We're not trying to make this all in front of anyone's face. We'll get you the corner. And that's when kids are like, look, Allah just wants us to remember, take a few minutes to remember you and you could do in the most safe safe proper way and Allah rewards you right. and I think those are kind of the factors and I think that's one thing I got to respect my dad when it came basketball he'd be like okay hey, when, when's it going to be halftime okay then we'll pray then he didn't be like shut it off and I, I, I still remember that right even though he was a tough guy right right never hit me but just to look bad I'm still scared of the bad <laughs> so, but the idea of just kind of keeping that in mind and saying hey look okay I realize that's my that's his little outlet right and I think for every kid and I don't care if it's sports but any kind of like debate team, any after school club things, it's huge. And especially for girls. Self image, I'm I'm a big p- proponent about women, girls have to play sports. Just exercise, serotonin levels, make them feel better who they are. Like, you know, so, some people, uh, for me, I don't drink coffee or any caffeine. Mm-hmm. Right? I've never had. But if I don't exercise in a few days, I that's when that. I feel tired. It's just, just that, you know, I think my mind already is, you know, kind of runs, kind of, uh, you know, just, it's always moving. But I think just keeping these certain things I'm seeing with kids now, with especially the mental illness or feeling self-esteem yeah. issues, I think, you know, so sports, man, such a big believer. That's why we've kind of made a push now that we even have a girls league here of like a 90 yeah. teams just at our own school I, for the community. I think that uh, really quickly close on that idea is, I mean, if you can get kids out of the house yeah. and off their screens. Mm-hmm. Sports is one great, yeah. Yeah, that's a huge win. And sports is a way to do that. You're getting them off the screens and out of the house, right? Well, it's funny you mentioned about self-esteem issues with, with, with girls specifically. You just happen to bring up about getting away from screens because you know, not, not all screens are equal and, and not all kids are approaching screen time as equal. Yeah. Boys, the problem is you know, they love gaming. Uh, yeah. They love YouTube. 
and they can spend hours on it. Yeah. Girls, on the other hand, they gravitate more towards you know Instagram and, yeah. and all these kind of things. So again, serotonin levels, ha having girls feel better about themselves, positivity, maybe positive self-image, mm -hmm. all those things are helpful. And just getting guys out of away from devices so they're not just gaming indoors for eight hours a day, nine hours a day, whatever it is. And, and I tell people like, it's yeah. any bother. Like you taking That's care right. of your body, That's Allah's, right. you know, amount of trust that he put in taking care of mm -hmm. it. It's gender money, right? right? You know, it's, right. it's just ways to really right. make kids feel like, hey, this is something good, and it's from a social, emotional aspect and a physical aspect. And then, and then you look at it when you get older too, like getting sujud and going down, like knees start hurting, so on and so forth. You know, so you realize that there, it just all, you know, so, it's just beautiful that more and more, yeah. I'm happy to see more and more parents are really pushing after school clubs sports teams, whatever, karate, soccer, I, you know, team sports, individual sports, but movement, getting out of the screen time. It's funny you say that. I'm just flying here, actually. I flew out of SFO, and SFO doesn't have a chapel, but they have yoga rooms. Mm -hmm. So some airports have chapels, mm -hmm. and chapels are great because you have to have been inside of a chapel where there's not at least someone who's left, like where the Qibla is, mm -hmm. or, you know, or left a Masala or John Imams to pray on. So anyway, but I was in the yoga room to pray, and uh, I walk in there, and there's another gentleman, and they're doing yoga and i decided to pray and then afterwards he struck up a conversation with me and he was just you know i think it's really cool that you know y'all's prayer is so movement driven mm -hmm. he's like i never appreciate it he's like i've you know he's like i assume you're muslim he, like he knew i was muslim or whatever yeah. just by seeing me pray but he was just like i just never put those together but just being here the two of us in a yoga room <laughs> i sort of appreciate <laughs> the fact that you're doing physical movement so that is a part of the ibadah, with the modality of worship. I think this idea of, uh, it's just a holistic approach to, to human beings, right? Yeah. We, we are a mind, body, and soul. True. And those three are absolutely interconnected. And now than ever before, mindfulness, there it's, you like, go. it's all there. Yeah. Man, yeah. it's our deen. It's the soul before, right? Like, you, know, you know, at another yeah. whole level. I, I definitely <laughs> want to dive into so many things yeah. that cross. But do we want to first talk about, Parvez, we want to first talk about the journey towards... Exactly. Bring us to here, and then I know there's a yeah. lot that we want to unpack yeah. with you. You go to undergrad. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in education, mm -hmm. teach, you know, Chicago, Detroit public schools. My wife's in medical school. You I do my master's. in Detroit. Yeah, I forgot about the that. Inner city, Detroit. I, 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 anywhere I've taught in public school is inner city. That's amazing. It, yes, yes, yes. I'm talking about stories. Yes. Mm -hmm. So my wife is a school teacher. She's an educator. Oh, nice. So she, I. This is probably one of the few times now that, and it's been ten years, but where she's taught in a suburban school. So, uh, huh. And Fremont, one could argue, is, <laughs> is suburban and urban in, right, in some right, ways. Right. But it, but no. Uh, nothing compared to teaching in inner city Detroit. Yes, She's yes. taught at a, at a charter school across from Ford Field, right down mm. Gre uh, Greek Town. Wow. Were you at like Detroit Public? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Right so by Old Tiger Stadium. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you were yeah, straight. How long were you in Detroit for? Uh, four years. What years? Uh, 1998 to 2002. That's why we know. Real I, I moved there in 02. Oh, okay. We were there yeah. 02 to 05. So you moved back to Chicago. Yeah, yeah, moved back. And then, you know, it was coming here. Were you living in Detroit at the time? Or did you live uh, in like, we, we lived in Southfield. Okay, of course. Yeah, Southfield. I think Canton the last two years. I see. Okay. Yeah. okay. Anyway, sorry. So we'll talk about that off mic. But, um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, everywhere you've taught was inner city. And then you come back to Chicago, same thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then when I come back to Chicago, there's a principal kind of leaving, right? Okay. You know, with the seven principals in the first, you know, 14 <laughs> years. Some people come like, hey, you know, what do you think about this? I'm like, man, should I come to snap school or? CPSI? No, no. Oh. MCC. MCC. Yeah, okay. you know, so it was yeah. there. And really quick, when you, as you talk about all this, um, a lot of folks, so obviously the vast majority of our listeners are not in Chicago. Yes. Uh, they're yeah, all over. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think folks outside of Chicago can appreciate so many things about the Muslim community in Chicago, just the amount of infrastructure, right. but specific to how many schools there are. Yes. I mean, I'm from the Bay Area. I was telling Perez just as we were driving over here, the, you know, the fact that there's a whole network of Muslim schools, Yes. forget even just like one or two good schools, there's mm -hmm. a whole network. Um, it, it just means there's, you're, you're really just ahead in many ways in, uh, in terms of, uh, so just as you tell your, um, share your experience, kind of paint where the Muslim schools are in their evolution obviously they weren't 20 years ago where they are today but i'd right. love to kind of you pepper that in as you as you tell the story and as you answer yeah. that question and, I, and again not to put you on the spot but oh, i no think problem. i think sometimes we forget because we often it, when even when we talk about institution building we sort of approach it purely from an uh, immigrant enterprise mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we can't forget when we, when we talk about islamic education i mean the sister claire muhammad school system that was developed 
you know, decades earlier, before immigration even began from, you know, uh, the heartland of Islam uh, was here. So I mean, if you could talk a little bit about that, because I know certainly yes. Chicago has a very rich history of that tradition. Yes. And, 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 it's, and it's awesome that you brought this up. I had an opportunity and I was in uh, about a month ago to talk about the history of education. And a lot of times when people think of some schools, they're like, oh yeah, the first Islam school was like in 19, you know, like, yeah. Like we're 35 years old, maybe the oldest might be like 37, you know, Garden Grove or here. Like literally, I was about to ask you if CPSI was the oldest Islamic school in China. Right, you no, know, no, no, no. May Allah bless, like, yeah, you know, I Sister Kermit and Muhammad schools. That's and right. My wife see Muhammad, you know, like where people don't realize, it's really the OG of Sunni Islam. That's right. Right, you know, oh, and, you know, uh, of, of, of in the United States, right? Absolutely. You know, just kind of really... Uh, and I think a lot of people don't uh, understand that, you know, I have the opportunity to go visit a few schools. Yeah, you know, now some of them kind of have closed down or kind of maybe consolidated. Right. But mashallah, I mean, and, and it, it just the, 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 the foresight of what, what, what they were trying to do right. is I think, you know, what's kind of st started that opportunity for us, right? That's to right. make it easy for us to open up schools. And I think a lot of times our, our immigrant community doesn't see the sacrifices of the black community to make things easier for us. Absolutely. You know, subhanAllah, you know, and so in so many ways from immigration, from education to even establishing masajids and, and schools, right? So I think uh, right now there's about 375 Islamic schools in the United States. I mean, back when in the 2002s, maybe, maybe, maybe it was like 100, 200, maybe five Islamic schools in Chicago. Now we're up to 14. So, yeah. so there's been just uptick of just more and more opportunities of growing and working together to kind of uh, make things easier. So, you know, you know, we have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so that by itself is there. So when I got here in 2002, you know, the school was about, two, I think it was like, they came up to like 280, had some struggles. So they went down to about 175, 195. So I was thinking like, hey, they're like, hey, why don't you come? I'm like, I don't know. Then my, you know, my dad's like, well, you know what? You know, we could all complain about some schools or you could be a part of making a change. Right. And then somehow. So, so. Uh, unpacking the name a little bit. So we, we're here at the MCC Academy. MCC, Muslim Community Center. Okay. So, so 1969, that... the oldest masjid, immigrant masjid, uh, that was uh, uh, built for not the black community. They were here before us. There was, I think, Alba uh, Albanian or Bos Bosnian community. So the 1968 or uh, 65, 66, it was like, uh, uh, and so they used to do Travi there, my father was telling me, you know, with the, uh, Dogur uncle, IFS founder. And uh, someone so we've mentioned on the show, oh, uh, Allah Yarham, several I mean, times. I mean, I mean. Uh, his son is a listener, uh, Harun. Oh. Harun, Harun yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. He's out in the bank. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So he, yeah. So they were kind of like the first initial individuals that they used to uh, upstairs. So I have a letter my father wrote to Elijah Muhammad. Okay. Right. To say, hey, and it no, could be, I, I could be missing. So, so, yeah, yeah. So, so they, they kind of have that. Imam Warizid Muhammad might have done that. For okay. IFS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Elijah Muhammad's it. son. Yeah, yeah. Yes, course. he was always there. His janazah was there. And yes, wait, and his so, janazah was there. So he might have been the one. Yeah, but Malcolm wait, X was in there. Yeah, tell us about that letter. Hang on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so, so, the letter, right, so in 63, my fa you know, father, a few of them, they wrote, you know, when they were trying to do the masjid at the Basin Center, it was like, hey, you know, we we would like to kind of, you know, kind of work. And then he wrote a nice letter back. I just said, hey, you know what, you know, you know, you know, please do your thing. We're doing our own kind of thing. But, you know, but the idea of, because they were already established. Of course. You know, so Elijah Muhammad, especially on 47th of Woodlawn. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, because, you know, right now my, my dad's getting old. So I'm trying to find, like, dig up stuff. You should, right. So we, we yeah. just c collected and gave Isna, like, a lot of stuff in the 60s. Stuff where, uh, you know, yeah. just, uh, as just kind of looking at it. Then you start realizing, like, oh, my God. So the work these individuals and how to get, you know, may Allah bless them. That's another whole you know, that could be another whole pocket just on right. the well, we history. Do. The history. We, we are trying to capture We are. That, I mean, yeah. that's, that was why the, when the idea of the show was sort of germinated in my mind, it was to, it was to be really an oral history of just well, capturing Islam awesome. in America. Yeah, nice, the history nice, of Islam nice. in America. Every, you know, and, and we've been able to piece together over a span of 10 years and 140 almost episodes, oh, sure. uh, you know, small sliver of that history, but then the last so. But yeah, so you taught it in the inner cities. You got this. So the the principal left of MCC. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is so MCC Academy is directly affiliated with MCC. Yeah, MCC. It's, it's a mother organization. Right. Got it. And so it was like one of the you know first schools, nineteen eighty nine. Okay. You know, when they first purchased that building for the mm -hmm. school, the community found out that the Muslims bought it. This is right, Persian Gulf for it. So there was a referendum to buy it back. Mm. Right. So there was a referendum in the in the village. Alhamdulillah, the Muslims, you know, like, you know, we, we spoke with the community and we, we had got the opportunity to purchase it. Yeah. In 2002, I get there, there was a, there was a masjid to be built there and to expand. And it was denied by the village. 
you know, this is, this is right after Persian Gulf, I mean, uh, uh, 9-11. And so that's what I realized when I got there too, is just building that community relations, right? So at first I was like, okay, should I do this? I was like, hey, you know what? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of funny because my father was kind of involved in the community, right? So he was a president, so he was kind of leaving. A former president of MCC. Pre MCC yeah. That's so, right. So, you know, so he's there, mm -hmm. maybe original few guys from the 1969. It was kind of funny. So when he was there, and so, you know, there are some people, because I've been part of the community, right? So I think, you know, I was like, hey, should I do this? What are people going to think, you know? But Hamla, man, Allah, Allah put, you know, Baraka. It was even funny. There was even an article someone had wrote. The, the king has left, the prince has come. <laughs> right? You know, like, you know, people, you know, try to, yeah. like, oh, what's this? But yeah. so I was like, you know, and my dad's like, well, you know what? Now you just going to have to go hardcore. Right. Like, oh, so, really the and the prince that's being referred to is it's you. Me. So you were the fresh prince. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah as, gotcha, as a gotcha. joke. <laughs> yeah, you know, some people who are kind of like, okay, you know, it's like, oh, he's yeah, just trying to give it to his son. That's right. So yeah. I was like, look, if, any, if, you, if you're going to do it, you have to do it as well. That's like skating. Right. The you know, king so, is so, left, so like, the prince. Right. So, so the idea now is like, yeah. okay, well, how do you, you know, I'm like, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, in, you know, the first two years, and, you know, no, no doubt about it. I mean, there was ups and downs. But, you know, I, you know, as working for the community, the Sunnah of Allah for the prophets, is that it wasn't easy. Which prophet had it easy, right? Only one prophet had it easy was Prophet Suleiman. And so that challenge is be grateful that you have, have it easy. So I think that's where I realized, like, okay, you know, my our elders, and I think my, I think the, luck, the, the benefit for me is that I grew up dealing, working with our uncles, seeing with their yeah. efforts. And so I realized they mean well, maybe their communication is there. So let me, how do I kind of navigate through right. that? Yeah. And I think that became the thing. Because most principles after two, three years is like out, oh, right? Yeah, exactly. Throughout the United States. Right. You know, Hamla, now it's been, you know, a blessing and slowly build, 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 where, you know, now I've been here 21 years. <laughs> right, right, right. So, but Hamla, you know, it's, it's been nice. And then let me go visit other schools. I've, you know, visited six, seven, eight, eight Islamic schools, helping out in any way possible. First initial kind of thing of doing it. Then I'm like, all yeah. right, let's build. Where we are right now, though, this looks like this was obviously an existing structure. Was yes. it always a school? Yeah. So, uh, so the original one yeah. campus is 19 in Martin Grove. So 2012. Is that the MEC? Yes. One yeah. So Martin, yeah, Martin Grove MEC, the original where the budget is. Yeah. That you know, we we were at 175. We slowly got moved up to by 2012 to 430. With about 350 kid waiting list. So was the was MEC the sort of educational arm of MCC? Those yes, two, yes, they, yes. They were yes. one and the same. So MCC Elston is in Chicago. Yes, sir. is the mother organization. Yeah. In 1989, they're like, "Hey, let's build, let's buy the school to and start that, a summer school." And that was an existing it, structure. It, so I remember existing that existing structure. 1989. We used to play ball in the. In it the played in the ball, gym. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so now that's you know that school slowly built, built, built. Mashallah, we got a lot of people coming. We're like, we need space. Allah opened up this door, we, and, and we found this place at 2000, you know, 2012 for $2 million, like 60,000 square foot, 27 classrooms, whole playground, soccer yeah. field. It's a beautiful building. Um, it? But it looks like this is like a consortium of, of other schools. Yeah, no, but yeah. so it's like that, there's yeah. another school around, but Skokie. but there's but a lot, lot of the land is ours too, Got so it. which is there. So Hamla is there, and now, so now we're at, so then we fill this up, so it gets to like, you know, 550, 600. Now we're, this year, inshallah, going to be 895 kids. Oh, mashallah. Two questions. Yes, sir. Um, one is when does and they're kind of not related so i'll yeah. let you figure <laughs> let you uh, decide how you want to answer in what order one is when does it go from different schools unaffiliated to the network and where there's some sort of partnership or, or mm -hmm. consistency um, and then two is i'd love to hear what issues where were the issues then versus how have those evolved to the issues today are they the same is it a completely different set of challenges? So you can, I'll let you take those two yeah. questions in any order you want. Look, I think Islamic schools, when they first started off, many of the people in leadership were not like school administrators, like degrees, right? There were just elders right. who maybe were, a lot of them were, when they said educator, they were a professor back home, right? <laughs> and professor you teach university is not the same as elementary middle school. So may Allah his, bless them. His dad is a professor. Right, right. You know, <laughs> you know, I, you know, so all of them came, you know. Yeah. And so they, they tried their best, right? And so, but there are certain things. And a lot of times it was just making sure academic success means good school. Yeah. But the idea is it's about culture. It's about, it's about that, that, that climate and culture, believing, belonging, sense of belonging, right? The Maslow hierarchy needs. Yep. Basic things. Connection. Like, that's connection a connection. Between like, the, what do you think the, of, when you think of school, when your days, you don't be like, man, that chemistry teacher was amazing. <laughs> it's about your buddies, your friends, the clubs. Now, it might be the chemistry teacher where this experiment that they did which you really like, man, that really got me excited about biology or to be a medicine or engineer. Sure. Not sure. what they, yeah, maybe not, not, it wasn't, it was their, if, if we did have um, a favorite teacher, it was more about their personality or their mm -hmm. character, character or yeah. their the connection we had with them. Yeah, that's right. Not about 
what specifically what they taught. Right. You know, guys, were yeah. I think when, earlier question someone asked about you know like who was one of my few role models like our you know I, yeah. for me it was an eighth grade teacher by Mr. Mr. Earl. He used to wear suits every day. Yeah. Like if anyone who's ever seen me, I wear suits. I wear jumpsuits. Like sometimes you know like you know like you know zipper you know yeah, yeah. Is he, and, right? except Fridays and Fridays right <laughs> Fridays would be you know suit or though right so and and one of the key fat and 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 and. Uh, and, and he used to come and play ball. So a lot of times you'll see these individuals, connections are through what people see, right? You know, that, that experience you had with the teacher. And so one of the things is in the starting was just to kind of how do you keep that school, you know, being for people to leave their public school arena to come here, just got to get the education quality there. Then the financially and to kind of still stay above, right? Stay afloat. And so I think that was maybe the first challenges as they came through. But I think one of the big things was how do you make it more professional, to structure, the environment, and that was that second phase of kind of again developing, and then also financially try to figure out how do you get more and more people coming in and qualify teachers, right? I like that, right? And then yeah. it was kind of building that process, and now and say, okay, now we have this, but now you got to think of the social emotional, the after school clubs, the teams. It's the third phase, like in the last mm. five, 10, 15 years, are really people are just believing into this, right? Mm. That it's not about academic success it's about not just learning information about the dean but how to implement it like faith in action like mm -hmm. to be good character good people you don't just need to know every again hadith quran they need to know this but to understand the context right so a lot of to shiyu but i you know had the opportunity to go to sometimes on and talk to them and say look you guys all know the content but if we we need to educate you teachers because i believe all our some such teachers should be ulama and you know but you need to also understand the context. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're not undermining the basics. You're going beyond the basics. Right, and like, and if you can kind of connect it, and so now it's like all these teachers saying, like, we have these curriculums, but now it's about the teaching methodology. Yeah. How do you connect them to become productive citizens in American society? So like, we're going to be Americans. Like, I love this country, right. right? But I, I want the best for this country. So I want to make sure I'm a great citizen. Mm -hmm. But with, through my values and moral character, I will could help benefit this country, mm -hmm. right? And that's the mindset that we want to do. So that's why even for our school, we're like, hey, when you graduate requirement, you have to like from fourth grade, you have to do community service. We have like interface fourth grade, fifth grade. You have to do, you know, at a soup kitchen by eighth grade graduation, you have to do 10 hours of community service somewhere else. You have to take a Toastmasters class. So before you graduate, you know how to give a talk. So every boy has to give a Jumma Khutbah. Mm. Every girl has to do a Khatra, right? Mm. For graduation requirement, you, persuasive, expository, descriptive, you have to write and you have to score at least a 75. Because you want these kids to build skill sets, right? So now it's not about, hey, just keeping them, you know, in a bubble. No, it's about I want to produce some of the solid and the Muslim educators, leaders of our community, right? And and build them to be like in the idea of making this, you know, America great kind of thing, right? And and and, and <laughs> in the sense of of uh, uh, and still keeping our values. Took the conversation exactly, I think, where I really wanted to take the conversation. So. A uh, few things I, that, that I wanted to, I, th I think that you're right. And I, I love how you broke broke it down into phases or, or putting it into Bay, Bay Area parlance, Silicon Valley parlance. It was like 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. Mm -hmm. If we can kind of trace it that way or frame it that way, mm -hmm. I think initially, you know, public school or Islamic schools, parents just sort of wanted to send their, like keep their kids insulated away from the sort of what they saw as the pitfalls mm -hmm. that they would encounter in public schools. Mm -hmm. So the concern was was just simply that, like we want to create like an environment where our Muslim children can be around other Muslim children. Correct. Yeah, and right. I, I I'm a big sports analogy guy. I would say playing defense instead of there you right, go. Very I love very, it. Very, love very it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and then like you said though, uh, I I think uh, and if I can just be very frank as well in terms of my, the sort of trepidations that I've held about mm -hmm. Islamic schools. Sure has been along the lines of three things. And, and I'd love to see how you and certainly your school and the, and the speaking you do and the leadership building that you do across the country mm -hmm. sort of addresses these three areas. Uh, because I don't think I'm alone in the concerns mm -hmm. that I, that I uh, mm -hmm. harbor. One is that the quality of education. Mm -hmm. So a, are my kids better off going to a mm -hmm. private school mm -hmm. or going to a great public school sure. versus Islamic schools? Sure. Number one. Number two is ideology. And then number three is insulation or insularity that our kids experience being in an Islamic school where they are in a little bit of a bubble. Or are they, and again, are they or are they sure. not in a bubble where once they go on to college, they're now confronted with non-Muslim students mm -hmm. and all of the sort of pitfalls mm -hmm. that we talked about in public schools mm -hmm. uh, now coming to, that they have to deal with mm -hmm. uh, head on. Yeah. And they don't, they're not equipped with the sort of wherewithal 
to be able to address that because they haven't been sort of nurtured in that kind of an environment that is diverse. Mm. So if you could maybe just so the, those three things. So the first part, uh, ed- uh, academics. I think there, you know, look, there are going to be 300 schools. There are going to be some schools that are maybe going through some struggles. But I think, and the, and the, but overall, if you do try to see some of the alumni who have gone through, our parents, our communities make sure academics are going to do well. And, and what we forget is many of us grew up in, in the inner city, like, you know, in the city. And now I was at the greatest schools. That's true. But what was the key? Your parents strive and make making sure you do well. That's why you'll see some of the kids that are like, I always enjoy the inner city. When you just have a family who's kind of push academics, you'll get there. Yeah. You do your best, Allah will take care of the rest. Mm. So when we have these things like, oh my God, academics, what's been different? Some of the, our greatest success were our first, our generation. Some of these kids are most laziest people at the most, you know, in the great school districts. Right. Like look at some of the guys right now, 20s and 30s, right? I mean, I'm not saying, but no, there's no. a lot of parents saying like, look, they're just too relaxed or too chill. Because they didn't go through their resilience at tough times, right? Mm. Right? Tough times make great men, right? Great men, you know, great times make some lazy people, right? <laughs> That's right? so true. And, and so what's happening is, so that idea when people bring this up, I'm like, look, where did you go from? Where, where did I go from? You know, yeah. all of us, many of them, were, everyone didn't move out to suburban in the 70s, 80s. Let's yeah. be honest. We all true. went where true. there was a minorities just to make things easy, a little comfortable, and through strive and struggles, Right. And yeah. I think so that that's there. But I think it's become better from the, yes, no doubt about it, 20, 30 years ago. No, you're they right. They were just I, trying to have it. But now the resources, and that's why Islamic School is working together. That was when I first got here. I was like, look, all Islamic School is we're working together. We're going to, I'm going to, how do I make you better? How do I, we make each other better? Because your success, my success, because it's about, about our community. Right. It's not about my school has to look better than the other schools. Right. And that's why it was, it was funny because many other states don't have all the Islamic schools working together. All the principals meet up every two months here, right? And by show them that we have, our, that we started our own conference, got some other schools in there. So now we're recognized by the state. We have, you know, workshops. And it's like the more we work together, for example, even buying paper, printer paper, we're like, if all 13 of us buy it together, we'll get a better rate from Canon than buying an individual. Mm-hmm. Like, so there's some things yeah, that yeah. you could buy pencils and stuff at a bulk rate. Just by working. And right, is that, working together, right? And just changing that mindset. And mm-hmm. real quick, is the is that working together? It's about 13, 14 schools, you said. Yeah, in Chicago, right? Okay. Where, where we're trying, what we, you know, we kind of had Bill got seven, we're adding more. Because that's what I wanted them to show and saying, look, forget boards. I'm like, all of us, we want success. But if I could tell you what some things I've learned, how do I help you? That's great. Right. And I think that was, it has to be, a, you know, the, the game changer. Right. And I think for me, playing sports, playing this and then growing up here, like, look, we all want to, you know, back home, I realized I was like, you know, who's number one, you know, because there's all rankings and, you know, how do I'm like, look, well, how do we just all win? Mm-hmm. Right. Your win is my win. Right. right. Especially if you know that there's this. For us, there's this other purpose. And I think that that by itself. So academics, I think it's gotten better, it's no gotten challenges. Better, yeah. But I'm not worried because our parents, will, you know, they're making sure that they'll go to Kuman and blah, 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 and everything. And I'm not worried about parents and academics. Got now, it. I'm worried about some of these kids who have all this all the resources, yeah. but don't drive, the drive's not there. That's true. The resilience, right. the, you know, the, uh, the work ethic, because kids are getting cell phones at 13, yeah. nice cars, but our first car, maybe 6, 17, 18, I remember Chevy Malibu Classic, 1979, whole door, or you get like a, 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 a cord to sell, like something like someone's old one, 50, 60,000 miles. We all saw the tough parts and then the uh, mashallah. And the problem is this, some of these kids are like, well, everything's there and lifestyle, lifestyle's oh, a little bit easier. Grow up and up. That, 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 that rigor drive, mm-hmm. It's not there. No. Yeah. Tesla's at age 16, sweet 16. 16. That's what I'm saying. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. No, it's privileged and they, they develop a sense of entitlement. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as a result of which. Okay, so, so, so the so, academics fine. one. Gotcha. So, so I, I think, no doubt about it, there are some schools struggling and that's why I think you need to yeah. look at it. And fine. we, as I think what's great, having parents who grew up here yeah. to push that effort, like, well, hey, we want higher expectations, gotcha. which is great. So I, I, a, a little detour, I know you, and again, being married to a teacher, are we giving competitive, competitive wages to educators so that they choose right. to come at, to MCC as opposed to going yeah. and working at so, Skokie so, School District. So that's that's kind of like the tough aspect, right? Because okay. we're, we're about 800, we're at 51 different countries at the school. Staff's about 30 different, 25 different countries. That is a challenge, right? Because we're trying to also, you know, we, you know, for some of you don't know, Skokie's, we're around the north side of Chicago. Yeah. So it's a very diverse community, it's socially, economic, religiously, yeah. and, and so v- various aspects. So what it is is that, you know, I was a big believer of six, $7,000, right, tuition. Someone's like, well, you have to 25. Then we're locking out half the people. Mm-hmm. It's not about the elite. For me, it's mm-hmm. like, if I could take someone who's scoring 35% time, get them at 55, and give them an opportunity so they don't have to go to the inner city, 
like, you know, we have like sometimes some spots for like refugee kids. Like, look, who's your, and you're like, we've gone to like sometimes a refugee center and be like, hey, who's your, some of your students? Let's, let's try to guide them. Mm. Change the change the whole trajectory of theirs. Right. So like what our parents did, change your whole life's trajectory. Yeah. Now I might be you know chilling with some cows and <laughs> playing cricket. You know whatever it is, yeah. I, it's a different world, right? When you went back there in the eighties, I was like, oh my god, thank you a lot. You know, give me America. Right? I love that chilling with cow, <laughs> chilling with cows and playing cricket. And playing cricket. I'm, cricket. I'm gonna have to use that. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and and so so I think that 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 opportunity. So that became the thing. So no doubt about it. Like you know, yeah. I mean, our salaries. You know, if new teacher coming out, maybe 32, 33. See, it That's is right. kind of tough. It That's is, right. right. And That's I think that becomes a challenge. I mean, I mean, I love bless my wife. Like, you know, she, you know, and she has never questioned me once. I'm like, why are you in some schools? Like, you know, she, she's a physician. You know, I, much kudos to her that she's been like, you know, she's like, okay, come here. Like, but I think and then Allah just opened up other doors. Okay. Like, you know, come here. Yeah, yeah. You know, got telling, got to university. So That's it's just right. kind of on its own way. Sure, sure. But. That, no doubt about it, right? Okay. And I think that became a thing. So I think that is a And challenge. that continues to And be we're trying to figure out, because how do you get enough? And, and then come, because half our Islam school is, the tuition is not taking care of all of it. At least 20, 30% where you still have to fundraise different ways, rent, a, rent the gym so and so wait, on and other so factors. So tuition that covers how much? I would say 80% of most Islamic schools. If you go six, 7,000. Now, if you go, like I know in California, the uh, tuition's kind of higher. So even us now- Not all schools. To, not now, all. We some, some, to, now we got to 8,000. So now it's kind of like still- yeah. A little yeah. higher. This is the first time we ever went up to the eight thousand. There's right. some schools that take the high tuition approach. Some schools that take yeah, the take lower that. tuition approach. Yeah. yeah. So, so you have that. So, so that's, tuition here is eight thousand dollars. Yeah. Per year. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and then, but then you offer people 20, who have financial about twenty five thirty percent of our population is getting some form of subs, you know, financial aid. That's right. So, and that covers about 80% of yeah. overhead. Yeah. So the 20% you still have to cover. Yeah. But then there are public schools who are doing that. Who are, who are doing that. Right. I mean, my my brother, you know, moved into the burbs, but I mean, you know, their kids were going to Chicago uh, Chicago School District and they had to fundraise yeah. all the time. Yeah, for after so. school activities. Yeah, that's and right. That's right. So the, the, there is that challenge, right? right. You know, but male, I, I have to tell some of the teachers, and I know a lot of times people are like, oh, because you don't have the teacher not getting paid the best, or you know, that means you don't have the best of teachers. Yeah. So I, I have that. And I think there are some people who can go and they don't. Like my, one of our principals, mashallah, bachelor's from University of Chicago, master's from Stanford. She can go anywhere, but she she's made a commitment here and may Allah bless her, right? Yeah. So I think those are kind of things that a lot of its own ways, I think it, we've kind of, it's developed and become better. How does Notre Dame, like I went to Exeter, the oldest boarding school in America, yeah. Exeter, you know, didn't start off, right? A lot of them were Puritans who started that first school. For Harvard sure. started as from a religious base, right? For sure. But Notre Dame did. Yeah. All these other schools, why can't we be there? Why can't we just be like, well, no, it can't. Like, it's, yes, it's going to be some struggles. Right. But we were setting up some, uh, you know, the steps. And a lot of times we, you know, we're always, I look at the glass half full, not empty. Yeah. Sometimes you look at the community, I'm like, do you understand what we did in 50 years? Yeah. It's institutions where it's, our, our, our Muslim community is maybe one of the most richest communities. Yeah. Like there's 65, 75 organizations in Chicago, oh, yeah. massages, 13 some schools. Everyone maybe has a budget of half a million. Yeah. Somehow they're all like, Surviving. People are giving, yeah, surviving, and, and that donor pool that's like, pool's often, like 20, 20, 30 million. People are giving, like they're do, they're giving, right? Mm, and, and, yeah. you know, sometimes people knock. I'm like, no, they are. Now so, but, the donor pool has maybe our lifestyles a little bit much different. We like more of our suits and so other things. We travel a lot more than our parents. Parents maybe had four outfits and that was it for sure, right? So that's going to be a concern and saying, mm -hmm. hey, and that's why, why I believe more than ever before summer school is important okay. because if not, we're you know any any society. First year you leave your language. Second, uh, um. Culture, third generation, your religion, faith. yeah, faith, and ever before. Think of any other groups here. How how many have lost their faith? That's right. And male, I if because we you know a lot of times some of my own friends go, well, well, you know, our, our, you know, if your kid wasn't, you know, if you weren't the principal, would you stay in Sunday school? I was like, what do we learn in Sunday school? And I'm like, I'm thinking maybe my parents will be more involved, so maybe I, I got experience a little bit more. Most of my friends, that just six, seven, eight students. I'm like, what can you teach your own kid when you guys are both husband and wife are working? So at least give a foundation. Say, yeah, Allah, at least from preschool to A7, A3, I try to give them something. Yeah. And, and you will make sure the academic side, you're going to give them all the other aspects of it. And I'm like... Human, okay. private tutors. Yeah, yeah you, 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 they'll do all that aspect. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, at least you can get some foundational stuff that have at least who they are. Because yeah. if not, you're losing kids. Right. right? Okay. It's a bigger challenge. I could see my own kids like, you know, trying to you know, navigate and so on and so forth. So I think that idea, so that second part of faith, as you know, if you ask many of the elders... I remember my father goes, I learned, he goes, I learned my Islam here. Because back home, it was just called culture. 
So in now you get fifty one different countries. So now you're trying to separate culture and say this is fate. So that, this is what you, this is what brings is, everyone back together. This, I just went to two weddings this year, of of you know like of, of two different ethnicities getting to you know marry. Now you see like I just of my own graduates, right? Mm. Getting, getting you know getting for them to a Bosnian with the Syrian, right? You know, uh, and then and then uh, you have another one Bosnian with a Pakistani, right? So you're just now getting this idea of now back faith is like that combines you, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I'm, I feel that if Islamic schools, you know, like I, I got to deal with sometimes like, you know, like some uh, Homeland Security stuff. SubhanAllah, there has never been one extremist that's kind of like Islamic school individual, right? They're all connected through online information. Yeah. So the more you have religious institutions where you're teaching proper deen or at least have a better understanding, that's going to be more successful than... Uh, you know, just kind of letting them on their own. Right. Because most of them, when you're now trying to find Dean, you just, you go all throughout the world to find stuff. Right. And I think those are challenges that we want to show kids and saying, well, this is what our fate says. So right. I, th I think the way you, so, it sounds like you're answering the purpose of the second point yes. by saying s the bigger risk is from the internet or just nothingness or just... Yeah, no faith going, at yeah, all to yeah. extreme faith. The, no faith at all or getting their faith from online personalities or, mm -hmm. you know, or what have you? I think I think it sounds like that's that's the, big, the greater risk. Um, and for your third question was about. Well, I appreciate the way you responded to that. Of, you know, the, like the sort of concern around a, um, ideology. That, that that's a fair point. Yeah. But yeah, the third point was about graduates coming out too insulated mm -hmm. from the broader yeah, society. Yeah, the bubble. So I, yeah, I the think the bubble factor. You know, I, I could say, 20, 30 years ago. You know, your parents already didn't know, so you kind of insulating like, oh dang, this is another whole version. Like, but all of us grew up here. We are exp we are going out to eat half the time. We know our friends. You know my wife. You know you know you know medical meetings. So they're getting to exposed to things now. If a parent's closing their opportunities and just kind of shutting them off, then that becomes a problem, right? But if I'm already getting exposed, they're playing sports, they're going out, they're hanging out, going to movies, blah blah blah. They're getting what they need, and that phone's giving them a lot more. That's so true. So my whole duty is like, well, phone. I'm going to try to control. See, a lot of times people are like, well, you know, we grew up with music. What's wrong with that? I'm like, well, that doesn't mean I have to show it to my third, fourth, fifth grade. They're going to have their moments, right? So I was like Native Dean, all that stuff until the young Dean squad singing with them. And Zane Beak, I, I mean, man, well, blessed, but, you know, some of that stuff, I was like, oh, my God. Like, you can't <laughs> deal with it when you're driving. But you'll go until sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Uh, you're Zane Beak, you're the man. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, Cat Stevens, you know, you know, you know right. some of those things that, you know, it's even for us, it was hard to like, I mean, you're oh. talking to two cast teams. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, point but, made. By eight, by, by right. eighth grade, ninth grade, they're going to have an opportunity, but why have to expose them at this young age? Mm. So music, TV, and saying, look, no, I'm still going to block and keep their innocence, and there's going to be a time, but I'm going to make sure I give them their tools when that moment comes to make sure they understand it and yeah. know how to deal with it. I, I, think, the, I think the point about the phone, yeah, I think it's, right. a, That's it's a game, game changer. changer. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because um, just a side note, like I grew up in a small town and I grew up very insulated from like the rest mm. of the country because mm. we were like up in the Pacific Northwest Idaho border. But then I go back now, same town, nothing's changed. It's, it's not much di more diverse than it was uh, 30 years ago. But because of phones, they're in touch. They know about fashion. They know about this or that, right? So I think, like, you know, yeah, game phones are point. the game changers. So. And you see all over the world. Right now, like Dubai a few years ago, they were looking for curriculums here because you had a 50% of the, the, the youth population fail the, the, the religious exam, mm -hmm. right? Because you now, see, it's not no more, oh, I could go to, you know, a lot of times parents are like, well, I'm going to send them overseas. Overseas, they're, they're exposed to a lot more going on too, yeah. right? So uh, the internet... Those uh, those TV channels where you know with the where you have that you know magic box where you can see any any channel in the world, everything now of challenges are not just like America. Yes. It's everywhere, right? Yeah. And you don't if you don't deal with it and and and, and kind of talk about it. That's why we wrote, wrote wrote the book War Within the Hearts, right? I mean, when I grew up, I was like, why, why is that? It's just haram. Why is it haram? I want to know, right? Because I want to know why I can't go clubbing. I want to know why I couldn't drink. Yeah. Right? I want to just know, uh, you know, why, why you know can't hang out with the ladies, right? Right. So and, your book, sorry, yeah. Pause on that for a minute. What, what is the name of the book? A War Within the Hearts: The Struggles of the Muslim Youth. I, okay, and this book came out when? In two thousand six, maybe. Okay, because that's something we didn't touch on in the bio, so we mm -hmm. definitely wanted. I, I I do want you to talk about that project. Yeah, got got But it. but anyway, so yeah. Right, but but, but you know, yeah. in these things, right? These kids yeah. are challenged. Like, there yeah. are tab taboo topics or stuff that. Before we never talk about, we have to have these discussions. Mm. Our deed has answers for them. 
And when we just throw, bring it up and say hush us, then you got these kids going throughout, you know, on the line or trying to figure things out. Yeah. And I think when you ex- expose, that's why even like something like extremism, people are like, oh my God, what's this going on? I said, no, let's go back and learn your deen and saying, did you not realize after the death of the Prophet wasallam, you had people who were killed, now their grandkids of the Prophet wasallam. Uthman radiallahu an, who had beards and everything. So I'm like, this is not out of the norm now. That's man- Allah tells us there are going to be people who look religious, you know, act religious, but you have to learn and understand the deen and keep an eye on what, you, what you're, you're yeah. learning. Those conversations, when you, we, we can't just be like a utopia world. We have to yeah. talk about like, what was good? What can we learn from it? This is not out of the blue. That there were kids who were challenged and who maybe wanted to do zina back then too. It's not like, because we always look like, man, those, guys, those sahabas are so great. We're just haram, I mean, uh, you know, bad people. Right? You know, like, it's just it's just like another challenge. I'm like, well, until we start realizing, no, they, they have challenges too. And That's we do right. too. It's okay. And when you're going through these challenges and you're trying to work hard, Allah's going to reward you. Allah's trying to get you like hasanat. He's just, as long as you know, and that's your struggles, that's what it is. Like, you know, not that you have it. And I tell guys, I was like, look, you are not going out there to maybe find someone. They're going to come up to you. You're a good guy. You're not, you know, like in high school, college, like, you know, you're, you're not, you're always nice to girls. You never disrespect them. You don't cuss. There are going to be girls that are going to come up to you, right? So you have to realize that, hey, that's nothing wrong. But now that you decide to make barriers and parameters, Allah rewards you. That's hasanat. That's ibadah too. And I think that's when people are like, okay, because it's not, you know, you know, when we wrote that book, I had got emails from Kenya. I went to Kenya. There's another story I can tell you later. And then even Kabul, Afghanistan, right? Like, hey, you know, you know, I'm like, well, I don't respond back. I don't know who's, you know, like who the, who's on the other side. Yeah. But, you know, but these questions about music and stuff. Yeah. Because when you have these challenges when kids, and I think that's where it's so important that they get there. Because those kids are like, man, you know, music, everyone says haram. I'm like, let's think about this beauty of our theme. Words. Is words haram? No. Words combining together. Cat, sat, rat. No. Put words co- combined together are put in a sentence where there's a ra- rhythm. Oh, oh, I'm like, oh yeah. But, you know, I think see that's why our deen's oh, haram. I'm like, look, da da about the rock, right? right? When does our deen kind of say, hey, music kind of comes to take away the instrument issues? I'm not trying to get in there, but I'm just saying, if you have word singing where it's just good and it doesn't go against God's parameters, it's cool. Mm-hmm. And then when you break it down that to for a kid, it's like the deen makes sense. Right? We just say, it's hard on Western music. Is hard on. Like, stop just jumping on comments and just give kids opportunities to understand how, where does the ulama make these answers? So, are kids still struggling? Like, because I mean, obviously, that's been a perennial question, yeah. you know, around music yeah. or maybe Zabiha meat. Yeah. Is that still things that kids are contending with? I mean, you have, because you see, it's diverse now, right? So, so yeah. you know, like, I, I, I still have, it's funny because at our school, we're 51 countries. So, at second grader, you'll have a second grader. <laughs> always, there always happens every few years when okay. a kid goes. You know, some kids and parents bring up chicken baby nuggets. Uh-huh. Kid goes, you're eating haram, right? <laughs> then the parents are like, I can't believe you're school. I'm like, we're not teaching. The, same, the kid said this. Let us educate. You're and right. that's where we're going to have this conversation, right? Nice. You know, hey, as a school, <laughs> we'll provide, you know, zabiha and tayyab, yeah. you know, as, as a thing. But institutions were kind of opening it now for kids to understand that, right? Because even when I came in 2002, man, you know, we used to have like sometimes posters with eyes. People like, what, what is this? I'm like, really? so I think the community yeah. has very much, you know, become more and more understanding and kind of looking at and then you know we try to have that balance and yeah. there's some things that people feel uncomfortable no doubt about it some people don't take pictures no no doubt about it we had native dean some people like no 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 i'm like don't come that day right like you know we're going to have we've had having these opportunities and experiences i think is so important and, and and the beauty is kind of having these conversations and that's why even in our school we have our own other mind make the decision because everyone's going to come with everything right and i think we want our kids to understand say look there, there is this parameters in our dean there is a circle this is the decision we're going to take on this. And real quick, uh, what what are the issues if they're not if they kind of are getting a little maturity around like meat, music, and so forth? What are the things that are causing some confusion still yeah. amongst the youth? Yeah, Omar, that, you know that was a good question because one of the things I want you to realize is you know when I was when I give you the example of music, that's not the big number one issue. What we, when you're in Islamic schools or MENA, you're always going to have different kids at different levels, right? So those questions come up. But right now, yeah, there are different challenges, right? Now you have kids in the sense of where, as Muslims, do we deal with regarding it, believing in God it becomes a conversation. Yeah. Clothing is becoming a huge conversation mm. with girls, right? You know, you, know, you know, what is to say I'm not feeling comfortable wearing a scarf to we don't even have to wear scarves anymore. 
right? And that probably comes out of the culture we have about, you know, social media and of course you got to look good yeah, yeah, and, and all right. that. Yeah. Got to right? look good. And then you're also getting information about faith online. You don't really know who's on the other side of it. Just like we have those extreme issues that we were yeah, talking about, right. but if you've dealt with there, I, I went to hold extreme issue, but now you have weed. Oh, it's nothing wrong with it. I saw this one article. So that's to balance these conversations. And that's why it's so important for me to kids have to have a good foundation of their faith or say, no, I'd rather you ask us and let's try to give answers for them. Like we're right now trying to make videos of just these quick responses on questions, right? Me and Sheikh Saad, just kind of like for 12 to 18 year olds, right? Just kind of focus at that age and saying, all right, no, ask the question. And let's try to tell you how, how it's like, and break it down how our dean kind of deals with these conversations. Yeah. Rather than just saying, haram, halal. Right, okay, here's why some people might say this. Oh, I see why it's there. Because the way shit, look, Iblis is going to always try to make, try to find loopholes. And it's like, well, that's why this doesn't make sense in my faith, right? Sometimes before it was just social issues. I kind of like, this doesn't make, now, I, we never had this issue maybe 20, 30 years ago, but just questioning faith, Absolutely. right? Then evolution, answer like, well, oh, no, no, we can't have it. But if you have conversations saying, wait a minute, look, we know that Adam alayhi salam was created. But we also know that the angel said, Ya Allah, there was creation before you. Are you sure you want to do this again? So that means there was some creation. How it was created? Maybe did they have some of the same genetics of the new creation? Could be. No. Why are we not having that conversation say, oh my God, it could be no form of evolution? Absolutely. So we have to kind of like, wait, wait a minute. Our dean has answers for stuff. Like, you know, that's why even in our, like our school, middle school, we teach a class called Quran and Science because I want the kids to know, like, Allah brings people in different ways. For me, like it was the Prophet saw some. Some people have been like Quranic linguistics and tajweed, which I might be like, okay, not, you know, that's just not me. Some it might be just through like the fiqh. It could be everyone has their way getting close to God. And there are also some people who are going to get challenges that might not be a challenge for me that's going to take them away from God or Allah. And that is our duty to be like, all right, bring it on. Let's go through. Our deen has answers. Yes, it's going to be challenging, but let us at least be the, give the right narrative, then letting others have that, right? And so that's becoming this, you know, new challenge for Muslims schools. And now some of Islam schools are like, well, we're not ready for all this. And we're like, okay, well, let's get in people who can. It's just like, I might go, Hamla Allah's blessed me, maybe 100, 300 communities. But sometimes my own community, I have to have bring in someone else because, or, or my own kids, because I'm Baba, right? Sure. Like, so, who's that? So, so you, you do find yourself having to outsource some of that sometimes. Yes. One figure that's pretty popular among Muslim educators, at least one that I've come across is Leonard Sachs, for example. Uh -huh. Like, is, yes. is, is that kind of, not, not just him, I'm saying, but just. No, no. I mean, yeah. See, that, that individual has, has helped us make kids understand. Because sometimes, you know, if it's a Muslim saying, oh, you're just saying it from a Muslim perspective. Yeah. We just had the FBI do a presentation on online security this year right. at our school. Right, because I was like, no, we need to find someone else who's not Muslim to say this. Yeah. Because then they're gonna be like, okay, we're not just saying this because oh, you guys Muslims, you were just always worried about everything about everything. So no one said haram. I'm just saying, why do you? If we jump to the word haram, I'm just saying there are some concerns about social media. Some can be haram. Mm. Some can also psychologically take a challenge. And so I think that becomes one of the, uh, the things. Leonard Sa Sachs talked about just boys adrift and just being, bo you know, like to about girls' situations and boys are solid points in the social media and us parents being finally being parents. Like a lot of our new, like our parents who grew up, maybe because sometimes our parents were tough, we're also seeing parents being more relaxed. I'm like, how relaxed are you going to be? I'm like, would, right. you let, have, would you let some of these things happen? You know, our parents didn't. Fine, we don't have to be at that extreme, but it's almost like letting things go. No, no. We, Akhlaq, we, adab of our kids, you know? Absolutely. I, I think we, we, we talked about this off air, but like in, in, a, in a different context, but nonetheless, the idea of the pendulum completely, you know, kind of going the other way. I imagine you encounter that now where, at, you know, maybe 10 years ago, the overwhelming challenge you confronted was parents who are coming with a very you know, overtly strict mm -hmm. approach. Correct. Now it's almost like the opposite where everything goes kind of super lax. Right. So how do you address that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. You mentioned the issue of dress though. Like, yes. so for example, how do you approach that from the perspective of like, okay, you know, you may have sisters or girls who don't wear hijab. Are they okay? Is it okay to come to school without wearing hijab? So, you know, at the school, we, we, we you know, I, I'm a big believer that at least in middle school and high school, you yeah. give them an opportunity to at least try to practice it here. Right? Eight hours on a Monday, day. Monday, Thursday, Friday, yeah. Friday, we let them dress in their nice clothes. Because I went Friday, I want them to like, hey, dress to impress for the dean. But you, could, you don't have to wear, you know, a baya or a tunic. Yeah. You could dress something like Because I want kids to realize... Many of them are going to walk away not wearing a baya 
right? But there, you that's want right. them to say, Islamic dress is also anything that's covering yourself long, you yeah. know, yeah. Uh, modest, and, then, sure. and, and it's, there's a blessing. So I think giving kids the opportunities. So there is like a uniform. Yeah, there's a uniform. But one of the things I think for kids right now is where we're having these conversations, at, even at the youth, MENA, through even Islamic schools, is now kids, even because of the internet, like, oh, I can't believe this Muslim country does this. Who said Afghanistan is a Muslim country? I'm like, there might be some cultural things that are happening that they can't go to school. I'm like, so even with some of those things that Islamophobes bring, we have to educate our own kids and saying, look, that's because you read that. And now you might even have a Muslim saying how harsh their life was here. And then saying, well, yes, that could be. And certain countries, there are things. And that's why you have to learn your deen. Because I said, look, all of you, like, hey, somebody with your mom, is she not working? Did anyone say it's haram? here right do you see that your teacher teaching is there a hot arm right have them kind of come back and kind of go through their own realities yeah. and have that because you have these now certain things coming up and saying oh, oh, this oh honor killing this girl got killed right and saying all right well let's look at our dean what does our, our dean say about this and saying just because something is in a muslim country doesn't mean everything that doesn't mean every when you go to Islam school everything's not there's mis problems here too right and i think we need to get that out of our heads yeah Beyond those issues that you've covered and talked about, I know right now, especially in the news, we're hearing a lot about schools and what's being promoted at schools and mm -hmm. taught at schools, I mean, explicitly taught at schools. Mm -hmm. And there's been a movement, I mean, in some cases and in instances led by Muslims, yeah. uh, aligning with other conservatives who feel as though, or at least have the option to opt out of certain um, sort of curriculum, mm -hmm. uh, especially around the issue of gender, mm -hmm. especially then around the issue of sexuality and, mm -hmm. you know, is that something that you've had to sort of deal with or confront? So, you know, I have an opportunity, you know, I work with public, you know, school right. educators and, and, and okay. at the same time, uh, you know, at, in, in Islamic schools, I think one is to kind of have a conversation about that. Right. So and there we, is a need to at least state the, the the sort of normative position that Islam takes on this issue. Yes. Because think about it right now. If right. a child goes to the library there you in go. June, front, right, right when you walk in. Target, the mall. Yeah. So so there is this idea of having these conversations with kids is what does our dean say? And having open, honest, and looking at the age, you know. Appropriate. You know, age appropriate. Appropriate. For sure. Right, we but we can't walk away from it because I rather have our narrative, with the proper context, right, and the content to really go ahead and educate our kids, mm -hmm. and I think that's become something we have to ha have now. This idea of parents and saying, "Look, we have a right for what we want our kids to learn." Academically, no doubt, our school there there should be the idea of you know learning, you know respect, tolerance. understanding, mm -hmm. tolerance, sure. But at a young age, when did sexuality become a norm in first, second grade and making decisions? Where I, how many, when we were young, we wanted to be this athlete, that athlete, mm -hmm. we dressed this way. There's imagination gone wild. Mm -hmm. To make decisions that some decisions that you make when you're 18, you can't smoke until you're 18 or 21, or drink 21, drive when you're 16, mm -hmm. go to the movie rated R until you're 18. Mm -hmm. There are decisions where they've looked at. Even something like social media where they're like, fine, now what did the Surgeon General say? That do not let your child touch social media until the age of 14. It's taking a mental effect on the child. Things are going through. Right now, we're making quick decisions on letting kids make decisions that are lifelong decisions, affect their, life, in their future. Those are kind of concerns that I think as parents, we have a right to say, look, we want them to, uh, we should, we, if there's a day to have a better understanding. We've had Black History Month and others. Why? Right? You just want them to have an opportunity to understand who they are, what their process struggles. That's it, right? And it's to be a day or two just kind of going through. But I think now this idea of like, well, let's them all decide and ch decide what gender they want at, at preschool, pre-K, kindergarten ages. A parent has an opportunity and a decision to say, well, this is where I want to have some control or uh, of how I want to have that conversation with my child. Sure. You said you interact with, you know, educators in the public school system. I, I guess what approach are they adopting or what pushback maybe have they given you given how you've approached the issue here at the Islamic school? I mean, you know, for us, it's, it's you know, we want to make sure that we have to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and, and it's very important that we want all our kids to know any individual's of whatever the thought process. Like we have individuals, mm -hmm. you know, we might all grew up, have known guys who drink, mm -hmm. who fornicating, 
look, what, sin is a sin, but we, we, we love the person, we respect the person, we deal with the person. I think having those conversations. Now, one of the things that's happening in the public school arena is in saying, hey, there are some decisions that we're not having control over, right? And I think that's where we want to have. Sometimes there's even teachers, even in, in, you know, from other faith-based concerns about, hey, look, well, I'm forced to teach something. Now, not to just make them aware, but to now kind of force a, a conversation or you know, a decision for a child to make about what they want to be called. I don't need to tell their parents. Those are conversations even some public school teachers are kind of like, well, what's where are right, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's going on both sides. And, it. and again, you know, I think what you know, it, it, it is something that we need to do with wisdom. We want to kind of look at it. We can't get excited about it. And, and, I, and I always tell our kids, and that's why even educating, because sometimes even our own kids like, oh, I heard on National Geographic, someone said that, that you know, there's someone got, because they, they came out that they were gay, that they were stoned to that, right? I was like, first of all, that could be a, some tribal thing in some country. I was like, Do you, did you ever see the prophet said, hey, you know what? For anyone, any sinner. I said, for any fornicator, heterosexual, or even uh, uh, um, uh, same-sex attraction, did they go, find them, let's go get them. There's no, never. I said, the biggest sin in our deen was someone associating someone with God. And even that, the prophet knew who the monophic were, and he kept it to himself. Told one or two people, just we'll keep an eye on these guys. Right, right past. Mm-hmm. So sometimes our kids have to be like, think about that. And then I'm like, whoa. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, just because you're seeing and be it's so-called Muslim, you know, like, hey guys, don't get you you're kind of drinking like the same Kool-Aid, like sometimes extremists yeah. go get who go against a Muslim. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's something that just that's why it's so important to educate and say, look, don't sure. get emotional. Kind of talk it through. And when you talk to kids through it, they're like, okay, look, don't don't get rocked here. Right. We have answers for it. Now, no doubt about it, some people are going through struggles and I know there's been some organizations that work on them. I'll not make things easy, right? right, right. And I, I think, you know, so, but that, that's kind of, you know, I have that, right? And you get to another extreme of, of like, you know, you know, the manhood now, right? That's another whole conversation. Yeah. Right? Talk about that because I know obviously that's an issue. Look, you know, I, no doubt about it. I think what happens is now when you have this, sometimes extremes of like, okay, well, what is a man? What is not a man? Then you get the, you get the other side, right? You know, people kind of get into like, well, well, this is what we need to do, right? And so you have... You have individuals, and I'm not here to talk about, you know, who's who. You know, but you have the Andrew Tates, and kids, you know, listen to them, so on and so forth. And, you know, uh, uh, I'll, I'll help all of us in our mistakes and guide us all to become better individuals. Right. But I think I mean, that conversation, I mean, like, we have a class, you know, now we, we, we have, like, a Saturday class called Boys to Men. I was like, you know, our boys need to kind of just make sure, like, look, there are certain things that we just need to know that our duty of our faith that we, uh, to have a conversation, to have an open conversation, seeing what kids are talking about, and then saying, what does our dean t- say about this? And then, and then, and kind of taking care that, yes, we need our kids to be more in taking charge, right? You know, like one, one thing, you know, a lot of kids, like, you know, I'm getting a lot of parents like, well, you know, 25, 26, they're still chilling in college, you know, <laughs> haven't graduated, haven't moved. I was like, well, stepping up, learning how to like, so we even had a class like one, 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 one Saturday, change tires and check the oil. Yeah. Right, yeah. and then we had like one self defense. Then we like build, build a fire, yeah. right? We're just kind of teaching them like life skills, things like you know, checking account, like you know, like you know, because now everyone's like, Ooh, you know, no, it's so critical. Food, k- k- yeah. eat anytime you want, not realizing like, you know, there's a buddy. Like before, <laughs> you would know how much your money balance is. Right now, kids like you know, yeah. Uber this, Uber eats this, you know. No, you're right. And so I think ha- having these conversations and and and, and doing it in a more proper way is huge. Right. And, and it, no doubt about it that if we don't have these conversations for both for, for young ladies to understand, like, you know, hey, what, what does our dean say about this? Because our dean wants to have rights. There's nothing wrong for women to have rights. And but also we also understand, hey, what are the roles? What does God say? Who's Allah's al-alim and he's al-hakim, the most wise. There are some things that we might not understand, but as you go through, it all makes sense. Like what if some of our parents told us some stuff. Now you all you have kids. Sometimes I'm like, man, I would never do it. I'm like, I can't believe I'm doing the same thing my parents told Yeah, <laughs> You realize all that. The time. You worry about that. You know, your dad like, you know, why don't you come in at 10 o'clock? Now my dad is like, where are you coming? Check, call me when you leave it. Yeah, right? that's right. You have some of those same habits because you realize, through, you know, greatest form of knowledge is through experience. Experience. Right? And right. I think as we go through, that's become kind of changed. And I think that's where we have to make sure having conversations about, like, you know, like fitness is that that's part of the Right. Right, being a man, taking care of your family, you get hasanat taken care of. You doing good in school, so you could take care of a family and giving to the community. That's the thing. You, you know, you have a child, mom, and you're taking care of. 
you're getting, that's worship, Ibadah, right? And I think kind of changing the kind of things and saying, no, the, the, you know, this, this is uh, forms of uh, um, control and stuff. No, no doubt about it. In our community, we have issues. We do have individuals where some girls maybe do the way their fathers have interacted with them that they, hey, 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 or they feel this, this faith is so controlling. Right. It's male dominated. Male dominated. Because we've had issues in our culture, and we have to be honest with it. And we have to have conversations. You know what? Let's talk about that. Yeah. And he'd be like, no, no, no. Islam is peace. Islam is stuff. No, kids see stuff, right? Like, let's not like sugarcoat stuff and saying, well, we know that, but Allah talks about that we are going to have people who are going to do some things wrong. It's not out of the blue. It's not out of the norm. Yeah. It's not because of the West that this is all happening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's remarkable, you know, I think what Islamic schools have to contend with today that they didn't have to even 15 years ago, right? Because, again, social media, access to the internet has just sort of is a game changer, as mm -hmm. you know, you, you and I mentioned. Uh, kids can access anything. So in terms of presenting this kind of sanitized version of Islam or mm -hmm. Muslim history yeah. or anything for that matter, it's just not going to fly in the face of reality anymore because mm -hmm. kids are going to say, wait, what am I, I, I read something online or I saw yeah. this video. So uh, the fact that you're uh, you know, adopting a very kind of realistic approach or realism uh, in the way these uh, issues are talked about, I think that's really healthy. Is that something that, you know, I know, again, you do a great deal of speaking and consulting to other organizations and other Muslim institutions of, of learning. Is that something you promote? Yeah, I mean, more than like, that. what are your sort of big talking points when you do, when you are asked to go speak to, you know, like another Islamic school and, and the challenges that they bring to you for you to address? Yeah, for consult. Islamic schools and for parents, yeah, there you, go. you know, and stuff. I think one of the big, I think one, one first thing for tell parents, you need to have a good relationship with your kids, right? Fathers with daughters is huge. Okay, so talk more about that because yeah, you're you know, talking like, to two. Yeah, you know, we, like, yeah, yeah, we both have two daughters each. On yeah. the oh, yeah. You know, it's huge because... You want to make sure that the first girl, when the first boy that girl talks to, it's, you know, like the first time it's like, girl, you look cute, you, you, you much are nice. And then the father, and I tell dad, it's like, you got to be like, Masha, you, you look beautiful. You know, mm -hmm. now you don't have to like, oh, my prince is the most greatest, beautiful girl. You don't have to, you know, like go right. extreme. But they need to have that relationship, especially when they're young, because they want that father figure. And if there are only times are, you know, and then having that relationship where you hang out with them, going out and, you know, having lunch, figure out stuff. Because I realized when I was, when we were zero to like nine, 10, like they were like tight. Then teenage years, it comes a little bit like, we're not because I'm like, okay, what about this? Clothing, you know, all these conversations oh, yeah. like, all right, it's great. You're going to be play ball. You're going to have, you know, keep these in mind. You're going to go out to eat. And I'm like, okay, now we're double standards, right? Okay, you want to go out to eat to drive, get back by Tud, right? So having these conversations, because there are going to be times where we're going to have those moments yeah. and you have, and they have to be open to it. I'll give you my own uh, daughter's, Right, she was going to play. How high many kids school. do you have? I have three. Three, okay. Right? So yeah. now the other one's eighteen. Now I just graduated. Eighteen's your oldest. Oldest girl. Yeah, yeah girl. Okay, and then a uh, then a uh, sixteen year old daughter and a fourteen year old son. Mashallah. Okay. And so Mashallah, when, when they were in eighth grade, right? So you know, there's some school they were going to public school. My dad, you know, my daughter was like, "Bob, if I don't wear a scarf, are you gonna be mad?" Right. So I was like, "Thank you for asking." I'm like, "I'm so happy you even asked me the question." Yeah. And I asked her the first thing I asked her. I said, "Do you think it's a commandment of Allah?" She said, yeah, I'm just right now not feeling. I'm like, that's what I care about. If you just know it's a commandment of Allah, I said, Salah, I'm sorry, you, that, that you need to pray. Mm -hmm. Now we could accommodate, like, you know, and you know, at the school we have, we have a meditation room at the public school here. We have halal food, we have a Jumar prayer there. I'm like, there's opportunities. Now you're going to be questioning. If you don't come out, that's you and Allah now, right? But we've set some stuff. So Salah and stuff, those are things, right? Other stuff, I have to, right? Because I have to be honest that my mother lost, wore her scarf seven years ago. My wife started in college. My sister started in senior year in high school. Mm -hmm. I have to, when people get all excited, and like, oh, you know, I have this one brother who's like, man, he's like, my, 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 you know, I was studying Islam in school and so on and so forth. And now in college, and she was like kind of rebelling. I said, brother, when you, I was like, did your, great, your daughter do good in school and college? Yes. Did she have a girlfriend? No. Did she pray? Yes. I said, the only issue you had was this. I said, brother, when you first came to our school, you didn't have a beard. Mm -hmm. Your wife didn't wore a scarf. They, as you got Masha and Sadin, I'm like, we got to get their process. And it's tough. Even as a sometimes I'm like, come on, boy. Like, I know yeah. you yeah. want the, you know, like when you're, you want better for them. You do. From yeah. sports, mm -hmm. academics. Everything. Everything, right? And so you kind of can't wait. And I'm like, they got to go through that process. They got to go through the process. Now, I, could, I could give them, I just say, look, that's my job. My yeah. job is just kind of, it goes, I got to keep on doing it. And I kind of remind them, like, oh, you might think I'm tough. Right? There, there was those conversations, right? Right. Right? Because now I'm like high school, they're like, okay, now they're friends and listen to this kind of music. I'm like, okay, who right. is it? I'd rather know. I'm like, okay, Harry Styles, I could deal with that. Right? You know, like, you know, 
you know, the One Directions and so on and so forth. And you're kind of going through and then I have that. Oh, my God, he looks good. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'd rather know. Right. And like me have these conversations. Right? right. You know, I'm like, OK, you know, what, what are we doing? So I think that's so important. And for guys and with their, their father, boys, right? Because moms, moms and sons, they just become tight. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and then at some time, but at a certain age, I'm like, look, this boy needs to be a boy now. Dad's like step up 14, 15. That doesn't mean like straight. Boy well, needs have, to be a man now. Yeah, you need to be a man. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, but yeah, yeah. you know, uh, to be a man, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Right. And in that conversation, like, look, we need to have this, right? You know. And then sometimes I'm like, yeah. well, this is gonna be tough. We're gonna, you know, going through this. We're, you know, we're gonna be doing push-ups. We're doing these certain things. I'm like, That's right. there are certain times that they're gonna have to learn. No, it's a challenge. Right? I mean, I, I, can't, I mean, again, I don't have boys, but uh, sons. But I can imagine, right? I mean, for me and my daughters, it's like, look, I want to be the personification of the man that you want to marry mm-hmm. or that you're going to spend so the rest well, of your life so with, well. right? But for the, if I had a boy, if I had a son, it'd be like, I want, I, I want to be the personification of the boy you, or, or the man yeah. that you want to be. Yeah. So I can imagine you yeah. or parents out there who have, you know, uh, daughters and sons, uh, that's something they, they have to navigate. And it's a different yeah. muscle. It's true. Right? true. right? Especially like with the girls again, I, I also need to show you of the kind of man you don't want to be with, meaning again, yeah. not by being it, but right. by just again being the opposite of that. Yeah. Like I, I'm glad you started there, but I feel like you were gonna make some other points as well, like in terms of what you um, mentor and speak about when when, when you're out there. And, yeah. Uh, so so when it becomes yeah. building a relationship, sure. right? So yeah, so, building so, so that, that's good. Like you know, for, you know, when we talk to parents. And for educators, it's building that relationship too. And you might be like this because it's not about just teaching them learning. It's about building this oh, for sure. tarbia, right? right? I mean, that's our dean. And then saying that doesn't mean we have to be friendly, friendly. But like for example, after Salah, you know, before COVID, we would have all of our male staff shake every kid's hand after Sunnah, because I'm like, look, maybe one day you yell at him, the next day you're like, what's up, right? Because mm-hmm. our deans no animosity for more than 24, 48 hours, right? We got to get this stuff out of ours, mm-hmm. and then kind of hanging out, talking to them, so it's not just I'm just doing my job of educating you, but education is really touching your lives, yeah. you know, the tarbiya aspect of it. So 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 that the relationship comes on both sides, right? The se- 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 second thing is is being open in conversations and saying parents and saying, hey, we have communication, but then open to where someone brings up a tough question and saying, okay, you know what? Let me try to find this out. I'm like, yeah. how can you even c- come up with this? I'm like, all right, let's try to figure this out. Right. Right. And and then having these opportunities, especially now than ever before that, because sometimes you're like, I can't believe this kid did this. You know, this is that family from so-and-so's community. So a lot of times people come and say, brother, I can't believe so-and-so in Islamic school, this has happened. I'm like, oh. I said, you know, Allah reminds us and humbles all of us that he gives us a story of a person whose grandfather was a prophet, his father was a prophet, he was a prophet, and his brothers almost killed him. That's right. Right? Allah gives us an example for 900 years. He was like, come to the deed, come to the deed, and his old son didn't come to the deed. There's another prophet where he told him, come to the deed, and his wife didn't come. Allah will give us challenges. And but our duty is we keep on doing our best and making dua, then at the, at the end... That's all our, our job, mm-hmm. right? So building relationships, understanding, being open to it. We have to do self-reflections on ourselves because times change and kids are changed. And saying, we never, we never change our theme, but we change our approach, right? And I think that's kind of like the other things, right? So from even the methods of teaching that we're teaching our faith to academics and so on and so forth. Yeah. And then the last thing is building life skills, right? To become, is like this social emotional aspect. That's critical. Right? That's yeah. like... A key factor, which is which our prophet did. So it's like half the stuff that we do is coming back. All this mindfulness, all this. This is our dean, right? But we got so caught up. I sometimes feel on this on the 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 content and just informational aspect, but we forgot this whole beauty of our dean of the character. Mm-hmm. And I think just kind of building that social emotional and saying, hey, like, how do we get these kids to yeah. really life and saying, look, we are going to get challenges. And God knows He's going to give us challenges right. Right? because sometimes we're like, how can that happen? And 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 it happens within people. I mean, when I got sick. You know, people come like, oh, man, you know, I can't believe it happened to you. I'm like, no, Allah knows what's best for me. Can I have cancer? Yeah, you know, it's yeah. good for me. Allah had plants and I got to be patient for yeah. one of those. Uh, I was going to do this off mic, but I mean, I'm all, all clear. Oh, yeah. I'm a, last year remission, brother. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, so, so, I'm I'm so inshallah, November, my last CT scan. Inshallah. Yeah, Everyone, inshallah. peace, keep on making the work. Inshallah. You know? inshallah. inshallah. That was how many years ago? Uh, going on my fifth year now. Okay, yeah, mashallah. so it's a five-year remission. Yeah, yeah, so. five-year remission. Yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah, uh, man, I'll give you a long life, man, and a healthy I mean, life. So I mean. when I heard about that, that was, uh, yeah, I made a lot, a lot of dua for you. So I appreciate it. Just know that. So I want to talk about Minna as well. Yes. As, as an organization that has meant a lot to me, you know, seeing the resurgence of Minna the last couple of years mm. is, is obviously something that I'm very happy to see. 
what happened there in the middle, you think? Like there was a, I think there was that period where after you, pe people of our right. uh, vintage yes, 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 moved on and, and, and graduated. Yeah. Is that, is that Barbez? Is that because yeah. our kids, is that something that, did Mena really go away? Yeah, exactly. That's babies, what I want to ask. That's yeah, what I'm, I want, curious that, yeah, I'm curious about that yeah. as well. Like what happened there? I would say circa, you know, it, like I said, it could be just be me being out of the loop. But Perhaps. I felt it, it was something that was happening on a national level, mm, though, yes. where Mena did kind of go away for a little bit. What happened is you had Mena was, you know, yeah. most of it had like these 80s and 90s, right? And then it went to MSA. Yeah, that's right. Right? And one of the keys is that we have to realize everything was run by volunteers. Of course. And, and sometimes it trickles out. So it did, ha you know, camp still, still happened. But then we, we had to come to a point where the community got so big and life got, you know, bigger that you needed to have someone official assign full-time worker to make sure things connect. There you go. Because that was one of the challenges, right? Because after a while, there were still maybe two, three camps. Maybe it became local. But how do you get all the way to the West Coast? Suppose now the West Coast person now moved up because now after college, they moved back to the, you know, the Texas or something. Yeah. Right, so what we realized is that there was a time that hey, we just needed to kind of get that. So 2006, Dr. Joao Chamela, love that brother, love right? Him. So he kind yeah. of contacted and said, hey, look, man, you know, we just got to get some of this stuff we're kind of rolling. So we yeah. just saying, okay, someone just for it made a major impact on my life. Oh yeah, like you know, I'm yeah. telling you, like I grew up in Chicago, Shreve, right? So yeah. so I went to some of the mother stuff, you know, daddies and so on and yeah. so forth, and I was like, man, because you know, I love sports and like, what is this? Why are you wasting your time? Like they didn't know how to communicate. I was like, man, this is Dean, like you know. And then some men now where I was like, man, you could still practice your dean and still be somewhat kind of cool. You know, like you could still like be American kind of thing. That's right. And that was a game changer, right? And right. so for all, and then how many people we connected and the, how many people are movers and shakers of the world and, sh and the Muslim community for Minna. That's right. Right. And Hamla Rabbanani. Minna alumni. Alumni, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, so it was very important. I was like, well, you know what? When something has been good, I'm like, we need to. And then sometimes what happens is that we forget that that's what we need at that time. Well, I realized some people got there like, oh, then you came academic. No, but the camps were not so. We didn't we didn't focus on our our academic so yeah, activism, but not the yeah. the knowledge. I'm like, you know, when you're at 12 to 18, sometimes that's what you just that's need to you keep need. you. In the, yeah, yeah. And we sometimes forgot and we're like, really, I got to make it more academia. Or you know, brother, that was not. Yeah. There was too much uh, uh, activism kind of group kind of thing, and and then you know, you had some people like, oh, uh, maybe it's not there. I'm like, well, Allah has everything for a reason. And then I think when you start realizing 12 to 18, even though they're scholars and so on and so forth, and in college we get excited. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we, even there was a time there was like trying to bring all those hardcore scholars to 12, 13, 14 year olds. It's not that easy. No. Because they can't relate with them. No. And, and, and real quick, your your role in the bio said chair of MENA. Can you just explain? Yeah. So, so what, what we, what we have is? is that we have a, a little advisory board. Mm -hmm. So MENA is run by the youth, by, by, for the youth, by the youth, right? Mm -hmm. So all the kids call the campsites. They do everything. We just kind of make sure when something major doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is to build leadership, right? And that's where we learn how to... I mean, this is back in without cell phones, right? Calling a campsite, going there, picking up people at the airport, you know, just getting a phone call, right? No one had cell phones. You got to wait for that person until they came. Right. So a lot of it, it was run by the youth, right? You know, the, from the programming to the counselors were maybe college age students. And we were advisors just to make sure that you're still in the circle of the yeah. dean, right. uh, any major situations that there's always one or two adults. But what we had to do is also start finding, we finally got like one or two full-time paid employees. Really? Yeah, it is. Okay. So now we have a youth director in two, three. Uh -huh. Because it's a gone. You know, we have about 15 camps. Now we have online. We have a right. hero retreat, like a one whole month serious thing. Uh, now we're, you know, with Mifta, I think we're doing another program. Really? We're just kind of learning. Okay. Like, kind of like Mina. Mina. So, so it's, it's uh, interesting you, you mentioned Mifta because, um, so in my mind, I think the way I've made sense of the story is that I think, you know, MINA, MSA, ISNA, these um, organizations were entirely, you know, not, I don't want to say entirely, but were driven by utilitarian reasons, mm -hmm. right? You had, you know, that, that going back to that 1963 MSA yes. that became the first ISNA. Right. That generation, there were young students who came here for higher education. Then they started having children. Yep. And, you know, then you had to have families and uh, uh, content and programming and relevant, you know, information that, that, that appealed to all those various ages. And so I think MINA, ISNA, MSA just sort of organically grew out of that. Mm -hmm. But I think, like you said, I think when our generation, people like us kind of grew up, got careers, mm -hmm. and we started having kids... Mm -hmm. By that time, in that very short period of time, 
other organizations really like blossomed and grew in this mm -hmm. country. Yes. So like where once ISNA, MSA, uh, and MINA were kind of the, you know, flagship organizations that addressed the needs of the various sort of demographics. Now you have 50 organizations. Mass, YM. Yeah, mass, yeah, YM, yeah. but even beyond that, right? I mean, like you mentioned MIFTA, and you've got so many so of those organizations. organizations. Yeah. You mentioned Dallas. I mean, Dallas alone has like five major Muslim organizations. So I, I felt like the need was still being addressed. It just wasn't being addressed by MINA alone. Right. And, and and you got you and sometimes I felt like they did the nineties where they came and started the youth groups in their areas. They did. Because right? Mina's duty was not to have Mina chapters in the Muslims. We're like, we want you to just uh, inspire you, give you some skill sets so you I, could do some stuff yeah, back in your Muslims. We're not trying to be Mina chapters everywhere. That's right. Right? Right. And so sometimes people forgot that. I was like, look, hey, we're just kind of doing our stuff. But now they got so ISO we're like, well, we still need to kind of get these so you could keep that unified, bring some of the major players, because that's great. Like what the beauty, right. even though I haven't seen you for 15, 20 years. Yeah. But you could still kind of some way connect, right? Because right. there's that one initial kind of connecting those 12, maybe 14 to 18 year old That's right. years. Like, you know. That's right. Like, you're still boys in some ways, right? You know? Right, right, exactly. I, I mean, you know, you, you and I were at a wedding two days ago. And I mean, I, I re reconnected with so many people who I, I think 99.9% .9 of those people I know only only because of Minna. Subhanallah. Correct. Right? Yeah, for sure. Same with you. So 2006, Jawad reaches back out and says, yeah. "Hey, we gotta. I think Mina needs some TLC." Yep, yep, yep. So, so we we get you know, Mariam Salman, okay. and myself. We had two, three other individuals that we you know kind of got Omar Mahmoud, love it. And you know, uh, we're like, okay, let's you know, kind of you know, Hama. We, then we got brother Iyad Al Nashif, and then we we kind of started kind of getting he's the executive director and just kind of saying, okay, let's okay. kind of get some stuff. Okay. And then kind of kind of picking stuff up, right? Right. And, and then our dues kind of slow away, and they're kind of looking at, you know, Minna and, and relationship with this now, we're trying to figure out all those things out and stuff. Yeah. But Hamla, you know, it, it, it's great because I think now it's, it's kind of, it is. You know, you know we're kind of getting things back, we're getting right. alumni, kids coming. Mm -hmm. And I think those become challenges. And now also sometimes camps, there are also local, local massages have camps too. So, like at our own community, we have our own like girls' camp, boys' camp. So, not everyone's going to be going to Minna. But we're trying to get one or a few individuals. So yeah. even though I feel like Mina in itself got people going and, and doing their own things, and now Islamic schools, so it's kind of funny, my own kids, they're like, Baba, man, we're at Islamic school all the time. Do you have to go to another camp on our spring break? So for me, it's like the other, like, okay, we're not going to any religious right, right. Uh, programming. Right. Right. So it's, 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 so it's, it's crazy. But so as two dudes who live in the West Coast, I, I would just offer this and take it for what it's worth. Yeah. And, and I imagine you're already doing this, but I think each zone needs to be addressed differently because yes. our concerns are different. Yes. You guys are fortunate here in the Midwest. Yes. There are certain things that you don't even have to think about. It's yes. plug and play. Like you mentioned, you know, there, there are local mosques doing youth camps. Yes. I was like, what are you talking about, Willis? Like, yeah. because I, I, not where I'm, <laughs> yeah. not where I live. Yes, yeah. yes, so, yes, yes. So for example, I think, I think the West Coast, as much as I, you know, I love living there for other reasons. Yeah. It is a um, a barren wasteland yeah. when it comes to I think youth activities. Yeah. I think I'll just, I, I'll just echo that. And yeah. a lot. Of, yeah. I think a lot of our listeners are probably very surprised to hear that. But no, it's, it's just hundred yeah, percent. People think, oh, it's uh, you know, it's it's the land of sunshine and and you know, be, right. you know, beautiful weather, and it is that. But but at the same time, I think there's there's, there's a lot of needs in that in that region. A lot of but, needs, a lot yeah. of gaps. Right? And and it's right there. It's the twelve to eighteen year olds that it's that target audience that don't have anything. And I can speak to Southern California, Northern California, and the Pacific Northwest. So right. that's pretty much the entire West Coast. Right. Entire West Coast, 12 to 18, the needs of that very special demographic, and those are those are the formative years yes. where you make those relationships that you and I still sit, can sit across from each other and be like, yo, we're here because of the, yeah. of the connection we made at that, you know, during that time period uh, is critical. So like I said, take it for what it's worth. I think the West Coast needs a lot of TLC hey, from Minna. Anyone's li living wherever they are, you know, <laughs> Minna and stuff, you know, I would just say, here's the reason why it's so important. Yeah. If it's Minna or any other organization, but having some like a youth or a camp, yeah. even for six, seven days. You know, William Glasser is a Harvard psychologist and he, and he talks about what motivates kids, right? Who, uh, na, na, William Glasser. Okay. Right? And yeah. he talks, it's called the choice theory. And he, yes. the first thing is sense of belonging. Yes. Right? Same thing, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. So this idea of, Sense of belonging. What you do in one week is you got a group of kids in a counselor in one group. You're hanging out, making camps, and so on and so forth. Second part is that your your competence in gaining knowledge, right? Power, right? And the idea that you're learning. So seven days you're learning new du'as, hadith. You're giving a talk. There's you feel like you're building on something which is your faith, which is important to you. Sure. And your parents said that. Right. Third is freedom. 
you have opportunities on workshops to go here, you could go there. There's sometimes some lectures for everybody, then there's breakout sessions. And fourth is fun. Four things that makes people go, and I feel mm. like camps do that, right? Man. It's one week to get everyone together. You're getting all your salads, and your people are walking together. You're kind of cleaning the cabins together. You got to maybe clean up the the, the 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 den hall, right? You're learning. You're having some time. You're playing sports. You're doing arts and crafts. You're doing archery, things that you've never done before, canoeing. And I think that having that opportunity with idea of faith plays a big part, and you're making connections, not just locally. United States, right, right? Right. And so I think that's critical. And it's yeah. critical. Yeah, and, and, and more yeah, than yeah. ever before, yeah. I think it's like a game changer mm. that people need to do that. And that's why experiential learning and then having programming, not just have to be a lecture. Like, you know, at our school, we have, we have Beyblade tournaments. It's like Beyblade. It's like a, oh. it's, it's like tops, right? For kids, oh. some oh. of the younger kids. <laughs> right? And it's a, and, and just it's a competition, our yeah. airplane throwing competition. Okay. You can do the smallest things, but it gets yeah. people together. Yeah. On the first day, at Harvard University in summer, when we come in, we take them on the first day for two weeks when they're coming for like, you know, like six to seven year old uh, principals. They come in for two weeks for like a summer institute. Oh, okay. That's we take them to high ropes. Mm -hmm. We don't, it, like everyone's saying like first day, we're going to be like, oh my God, just give us a knowledge. And they're like, why are you taking us to high ropes out in the woods? Or we play a, a rock, paper, scissors game. Like we'll play like these other yeah, games and right. say, well, you know, because there's, there's benefits of getting to build for even if we're going to learn something mm. we need to kind of get to know each other yeah right and i think that is what's what's kind of that even though we all went through our different ways but that relationship and will be have uh, give us the opportunity to kind of have those tough conversations even if we change our views on stuff in life. yeah no no absolutely and i think you know i i think not forgetting the secret sauce yes like what worked back then i think and again and take it for what it's worth was that we had a zero to very low threshold in terms of induction. Mm -hmm. Come as you are. Yeah. Come as you are. You could be the type of, you could be the person who had two, uh, two juz of the Quran memorized, yes. and you could be the person who knew two surahs. Yes. But both of those people were equally engaged, felt equally welcomed, and didn't feel as though there was like a threshold or, or, or a certain, you know, like metric they had to reach in order to be even inducted or included. Mm -hmm. So I think not missing, not losing out on that secret sauce is, is, is really critical because I think there's enough spaces yes. out there where certain people are just not, because the threshold is so high, they just don't feel welcomed. I would offer that as, as a piece of advice in terms of keeping that as low as possible of a threshold. Of course, we have our bare, we, sure, we have our sure. standards. I'm not Fair. saying, Fair. you know, anything goes. Yes. I just mean in terms of creating an at atmosphere and, you know, maybe even addressing or having content that is relevant to people who may be across the spectrum in terms of practice. And, and that's why I think- At that age, especially. Fair. And, and that's why, you know, sometimes people might, oh my God, I mean, this might be liberal. I'm like, look, there are going to be, we're going to still stay in the parameters. But that's why what people don't realize, big cities like Chicago, it's there are a lot of stuff. But kids come from all over. I had exactly. a girl come from Monroe, Louisiana. And I remember she was like, yeah, this is awesome. And I finally went to her community. She was the only Muslim in the school. And I went to that school, yeah, the high school, this is like, there was the American flag and the Confederate flag under her, right? See? It was like the challenge is, I was like, man, may Allah reward you. I think for you to practice your deen, being the only girl, thousand kids to wear a scarf. Like, you don't see kids all these other small rural towns. Like I was just went to Clinton, Iowa. Like sometimes you start realizing, says subhanAllah. But the beauty of our community, I think our, what we need to do, and mm -hmm. that's why you look at the great scholars from pa the past, they, you, they traveled and they opened their minds up. Our Muslim community, until we, you know, upset just judging, like, you know, we joke around about like, you know, like, uh, California Islam, you know, you know but, but until you go and you kind of look at it and say, like, you know, we're all joking, right? But, you know, yeah. but there are some people really like, oh my God, you know, they're, they're too liberal about stuff or, you know, okay. you know, Chicago's right. too conservative or sure. this area, or even Chicago, this area to that area, right? And I think we have to start realizing and say, no, everyone can come to this faith and Allah decides how that's going to be. How do we all work together? Yeah, that's everyone, what I'm saying. And everyone's got mm -hmm. that station and that's going to get them to Allah and then Allah, man, Allah's going to, that person might be a higher station, man. I'm just trying to just, I'm just trying to make it. Give me, the, think, give me the ghettos of Jannah, you know? <laughs> just, just give me in. <laughs> no, because I think we're missing out on a large swath of the American Muslim community mm -hmm. if we don't, like, to all accusations of Minna being too liberal, like, Minna ain't liberal enough, bro. Yeah. <laughs> to, no, no, and I mean yeah. that in a sense of, because for the large swath of the Muslim community, Believe me, the, the issues that they're struggling with, bare minimum. Mm -hmm. So this idea that, you know, organizations 
it, I think I'm really big on this idea that organizations need to keep that threshold of entry and induction as little low and as little as possible. Otherwise, you just speak right. uh, preaching to the choir. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It, it's it's and if you want to get academic about it, like like Dr. Sherman Jackson, you know, he talks extensively about this: the idea of the public minimum and the private maximum, concentric circles. I nice. mean, we, don't, we can't we don't have a visual aid right, here, right, but right. to draw it out. But I think that's critical. That the, the vast majority of the Muslim community is out there. And if we do it the opposite, where you have the public maximum and the private minimum, you're going to exclude a large swath of the Muslim community yeah. who has no resources, no recourse right. for their children and for their, you know, for their well-being other than what an organization like Mena can offer them. Yeah. So just no, no, I, fodder, I appreciate food, food for thought. No, food for thought. And, 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 I, and I look at two ways. One and if is I had the ear of Jawad, I'd say the same thing. Yeah, no, no to, to keep it, you know, to, yeah. we want to keep it open. And then have the opportunities. And, and I'm a big believer. We need to have our kids come to our masajids and so on. I'm oh, a big I, I agree. There's barakah, right? You know, no, like no, I know no, that the third sure. space. I think, look, we need to keep an open no. space. But I'm also going to take for, for just the, so you know, I'm not coming at this from like some no, 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 California no. Islam no, third no, space no, no. angle. I, I think I, it's solid. I, and and but at the same time, one of the right. things I'm trying to exp you know is that I want also our community to be, or especially the younger generation. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, 12 come 18. in, but also be patient because there are going to be some people who might not understand. You know, like so. Flex can, that for out, example, right? like yeah. so, someone might come in, and then they might be like, you know, so like I have kids sometimes coming with shorts. Right, and then they, they they come on, and, and and I'm like, hey, like I'm like, hey guys. Also, let's be aware if there's amus there, like, hey, try to at least, amus. right, our, our, our elders, <laughs> yeah. uh, our uncles, <laughs> sure, sure. And say like, we also have to just be a little aware and say, hey, there might be some opportunities that they might yeah. say something like. So try to put yourself in at least, you know, try to put on if you're for salah, at least get up to your knees because sometimes yeah. some, sometimes kids are being very. Their shorts are coming on another whole level now, right? <laughs> I'm talking about boys, right? Yeah, I'm like, no, look, no, right, guys. Right, right. So I'm like. We have a right that the, it's okay to get some, like kids are also like, they need to also hear a little critique too. Yeah. And, and kind oh, of balance, right? Oh, but but I'm, but I think it's so important. I think for all communities and schools, and, yeah. and it's a balancing act because you have everyone coming. Like, you know, a lot of times, you know, our elders, we, you know, they knock on the muscles, but it's not easy because everyone's got a comment. Right. And so they, they may, you know, so they're always trying to balance it off. Oh, and I think, but, but the beauty is that we, as, uh, you know, from a minute's perspective and any of yeah. things, we, we need to keep that op opportunity and open yeah. and go through and then try to see where we can navigate situations if, 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 if it arises. Yeah. I haven't availed myself of, I think, some of Minna's offerings. I mean, I know, Omar, yeah. you sent your daughter. Yeah. You know, I have a 16 year old. Oh, yeah. nice. Um, I sadly, those years that I wanted, to send her is, is the pandemic. Yeah. Like those really yeah. early years. Yeah. So she was a little hesitant when I sent her at 15. Okay. I think I got her to go got I, and I got her to stay. And I think it was net positive. I'd like, I'd love it if she got more opportunities. Yeah. This is Minna West but coast. Minna West. Yeah. yeah the one okay. in um, Livermore, California oh, nice, last nice. year. But I know of course, you know, it's, um, it's a couple times a year. Yes. My 10 year old, uh, I have, inshallah, inshallah, every intention. The minute she's eligible, <laughs> yeah. inshallah, there's no pandemic. Yeah, uh, and because I'm, the reason I'm saying this is because I am an absolute believer in the the pillars that you uh, outlined in terms of the value, the value mm -hmm. proposition of mm -hmm. those 100% resonated. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just personally, I'm really looking yeah. forward to, to her turning 12. And even, you know, your 15 year old um, at 16, the time, I'm 16, 16 yeah. now, but I'm saying if I recall correctly, when she attended, I mean, you know, whether she remembered, you know, the majority of the content that was presented or not, what she did take away from it was, you know, relationships yeah, and connections that hopefully blossomed into further and deeper friendships. Yeah. I, I mean, I, like I said, I think she was hesitant, it took her some time to warm up, but yeah, she, she's gotten invited to a few birthday parties after the fact. Yeah. I do think there is some level of, you need to just, it's not. It's like going to the gym. You want one exercise, yeah. one no, one no, time at the right. gym doesn't necessarily right. cut it. Absolutely, you need a bit of repetition and consistency. Right. But to Parvez's point, you know, we're kind of thirsty for those two annual plus the spring event, the summer, the winter, and the spring. That's a shorter one. Mm -hmm. And to Parvez's point, there's really not much else out there for twelve to eighteen year olds yeah. in mm -hmm. yeah. on the entire West Coast. And again, there's a perception that. It's it's saturated, saturated with, opportunities. with opportunities exactly, but it's 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 uh, sadly not. Yeah, exactly. So no, that's uh, good, and I appreciate that. And yeah. what we're doing is we're we're doing data now, so the kids are after a camp to see like now and it affects and say from a spiritual standpoint. Really you went standpoint, exactly where, where I because we're learning to go. from it. Yeah, I think now using data points to make better decisions. That's so what the, what's, what the next level in our organization is saying. Don't just do it. Let's how do we make it better? 
What are we seeing? What it's not going well? Food, cabins, counselors. Yeah. We realize counselors make the camp. That's and, right. Oh, so, and food is absolutely training. critical, by the way. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, no, that's, and sometimes no, we get a campsite where it's like, man, this was not a good No, campsite. I think that's yeah, really important. Right. I mean, using those data points, first of all, soliciting those data points from attendees. Yes. And then actually putting that data to use, though. Because I know what happens in these organizations. Yes. There's a, a kind of inertia that sets yeah. in where it's just like, hey, man, you know, last year we got terrible reviews. Yeah. And that idea just completely fell on his face. But guess what? We're going to do yeah. it again and, because and, yeah. it's like yeah. tried and true. And to your point, Barbiz, regional differences. Yes. So yes. I'm, right. I'm, I'll, I'll be regional honest. Regional particularity. California kids are very spoiled. Yeah. Yeah. They're even eating avocado toast <laughs> for breakfast. <laughs> They're having sushi for lunch right. and, and so on, right? So um, no, I'm not dissing the Texans or anything, yeah. but you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, they may not regional care about particularity avocado toast, is important. Right? Exactly. It so is. food yes. might you know, food yeah. might be a bigger factor for Californian kids. I'm just generalizing, but you know what yeah. I mean? One thing we didn't touch on, just as we as we start to wrap, yeah. is your your books. Yeah, um, uh, you mentioned one book. I know you have five books. Mm -hmm. So uh, really quickly, talk about those, and then uh, we'll definitely start wrapping. I know it's getting late. Yeah. Uh, uh, so War Within the Hearts: The Struggles of the Muslim Youth is the first one uh, that we wrote. Uh, we're, inshallah, we're coming out with three, the new version this year. We're adding on uh, several kind of hot topics. We were going back and forth on some topics. So who's uh, so the inshallah. audience for that book? Uh, 12 to 18 year olds. Oh, yes. Okay. You're speaking so, directly to them. Yes. Not yes. their parents. Not to parents. We parents, we want them to read it because it at least gives you an idea like what, what's the challenges and you know yeah. how to talk to them about this. Right. And so that became a, one of our big Is it like a textbook? I mean, what's the format? It's, it's, you know, it's, uh, I, mean, I think uh, it's it's very uh easy to read. Gotcha. Kind of, you know, like I mean, we changed it, but back then the topics were in the club, like, you know, for a club. I, I use all songs, uh, titles for oh, every title. Nice. Right? So, cool, cool, cool. Uh, you know, parents don't understand, <laughs> you oh, know, from, nice, uh, nice. T, uh, you know, back, uh, Will yeah, Smith. For sure. Right? You know, so. Cool. Okay. Uh, the rhythm's so going to get you. <laughs> the music. <laughs> right? So, uh, we, we've kind of, you know, so right now we've sent it out to about 20 kids yeah. to see what their thoughts are. To make some adjustments and have them write about a few. Was times. the one about the beef called "Where's the Beef"? No, I heard the beef. <laughs> it's such a dated. Yeah, very yeah, dated. Yeah, 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 dated yes, 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 yeah. yes. Speaking of dated references, yeah. yeah, yeah so you know, uh -huh. we're kind of looking at that, and with yeah. that, we're having a separate book for boys called "Boys to Men." So that's coming out. Yeah. Um, uh, the other book that we had back in the day was called P "Parenting: Who Said It Was Easy," to kind of show parents like look their challenges. And the the one that was, uh, we're gonna kind of re-update it now because some you know this is like. When I was like, maybe my kids were like six, seven years old. Mm. I think there's a lot more I've learned now. You know, I want to kind of add on some some stuff. Right. The other one was like, you know, um, lessons, wisdom of the wise, the mm. lessons of Luqman mm. to his son, right? And yeah. I think you know, you know, those were kind of three. The other, the fourth one was thank God it was Juma to start Juma thank, prayers. Thank God is oh, thank, thank God, God is Juma. Okay, yeah, yeah. From you know TGI Friday kind of, of course, thing. Of course. And the idea was just kind of kind of encourage people to start Juma prayers at their public schools and start MSAs yeah. at the high schools. You know, one of the earliest videos that Hassan Minhaj ever did was called "Thank God It's It's Juma." Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know, know if you know. That. You can find it on YouTube. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hilarious. Uh, are these? Yeah, you are can these... see the beginnings of yeah. Hassan Minhaj as a comedian. Yeah, awesome. yeah, it, sure. it was it was like your you know Mina Mina days uh, yeah, yeah Mina days right it's it, it's just making uh, you know goat uh, milk or something I could be wrong that was before even goat milk yeah, productions. Okay. Oh yeah, wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And oh, these, yeah. these are available on. Your yeah. site or so, so the new, yeah, yeah. It's going to be, I think, Icar on some of the bookstores, but now all of them are kind of sold out, so we're kind of reprinting everything. Okay, please. So do. like even uh if you go to like Apple Pay, you can get for like three dollars the world in the hearts. Okay. It should be online, oh, yeah. you know. Like a Kindle. Version. So yeah, our no, new no. books we're just gonna do them like all online just to kind of get them. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So not so physical. That, so right now we've put a lot of times the last year or two made about two, three hundred videos, uh called Muslim Mentor. You can get that on YouTube or a Wallaway Foundation. And we made just on education, parents. It's kind of open source. Okay. And just kind of like where, where and where are these uh, on, yeah. you said on YouTube? Uh, Wallaway Foundation. So on YouTube, if you t type in Muslim Mentor, that should okay. get there or, or my name. And, and so we're kind of making these open sources because when I went overseas looking at where educators needed stuff, um, like when I was like in Karachi, like in a small remote place where she's like one teacher, 100 kids. Wow. And they're like, you know, which can you come more for training? I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make videos. Just watch, you know, like, there you, go. you know, have that. Go you Khan know, Academy Like, you know, tell you, yeah, Kenya, like, because there's challenges you just have yeah. and you start realizing yeah. some of the things that... You know, I was in Kenya, and there were like 110 ladies outside in the hot heat. Mm -hmm. Just have a tent for me. They're like, we don't have any PowerPoint here. Can you do a presentation? I'm like, man, they're here. I got this. Like, you know, I'm not going to complain. Like, let's make this happen. Right, right. Right. And then you see some of the challenges. You know, I had the opportunity to go to Mombasa, 
And so one of them went hard. So I, like I went on behalf of the State Department. So we went to so after that Nairobi bombings, right? Yeah, so yeah. Nairobi, Nakaru, then I go to Mombasa. So Mombasa is on the outskirts of some you know right by the, the you know the sea ocean, and the Somali pirates, right? So Shabab would come and recruit the kids on on, on cyber cafes. Oh wow! Right. So I'm here kind of talking to the community and so on and so forth, and then there's this. They're going through these th- things, right? And this is where I realized how much just teaching our theme. And, uh, you know, so in, 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 in Mubasa, they're like, hey, do you mind wearing traditional clothing? I'm like, I got you. I'm going to wear whatever you want me to wear. <laughs> and I realized because there's like pictures of, still some pictures of Osama bin Laden, right? Like, you know, oh. right? And, yeah. um, and they were talking, we we're having conversations, and uh, there, things are going well. And finally, we have Q&A. And, um, Questions happen, questions happen. And finally, that one question comes up and it says, thank you for coming here. But you know where you come from? You come from America. And you know what, you know, you know what, they, what they did to Osama bin Laden? I said, they, they, they shot him and they threw him in the ocean. Your country. What are you going to do to say to our brother? Right? right. So that was quiet. So I go, may Allah's help. Right? So I go, Jazakallah khair. If you, you know, if you think, you know, what Osama bin Laden did and, you know, and, and, and Hamla, if he was right, and then your Muslim, uh, Muslim brother, I, was, I think yeah. I was just trying to be political. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, Allah, if he was in the ocean, you know that the angels took him to the seven heavens if he was correct, and Allah will take care of it. Yeah. I said, today, did I say anything against Quran and Sunnah? Today, I'm talking about our youth where 40% of the male population is on HIV. That 40, 50% you use that gut, there's this the chewing tobacco thing, it's like uh-huh. a drug. That, you know, 50% population lives on $1 a day. That we're killing each other. That's what God's going to ask you. He's not going to ask you about Osama bin Laden. Someone goes, stop me. <laughs> Allah, whatever, right? The now, I'll be shaking hands, yeah. shaking hands. And someone gives you a door, like, where are you? Where, where, where are you staying? We'd like to meet with you. My right. security's like, did you tell them where you're staying? I'm like, no. I was staying 50 miles away. Every time I get in the car, they would want my car. Right, the whole security. Wow, they're like they're going to kidnap you. <laughs> so, right, so crazy, it was bro. kind of crazy. And the reason I was kind of bringing this up is that when yeah. I'm going there, because the mother, they're, they're over there, they're teaching in Arabic. I said, these kids, you got to speak to in Swahili, talk mm. about what's going on and not about the world. But it just kind of gives you kind of like you know um, just unique experience of how would people would do some crazy things. Yeah, because when you don't have anything else, you have nothing to live for. You're not educated. People could keep keeply quickly manipulate. convince you, manipulate yeah. you, and do that. Mm-hmm. And it happened once when we had some extremism stuff and said, I remember I were at a TV, you know, at a conference, a news conference, and someone said, well, how can this happen when people, extreme kids do this? I said, if you go ahead, and I remember the guy asked and said, how many of you guys think this, you know, we were at this, at this mosque and one of the reporters and said, how many things, you know, 9-11 is a conspiracy? And there, you know, some people were raising their hands. And I said, brother, you got to be very careful. I hope you don't write this. And, I, and it, was a, it was a newspaper, and I'm not going to say his guy's name. Mm-hmm. So I kind of talked to you for a second. I said, if you ask the same question at right now, inner city, uh, city of Chicago, and say, how many people trust the police? You're going to have about 30, 40. I mean, you're asking individuals come from countries mm-hmm. where sometimes people are jailed that have no reasons for it. Yeah. There's corruption. So you right. got to be very careful with the background. Now, the second thing of how can people do some extreme things, how can Chicago has more than 600 killings a day? I mean, in a year, 2,000 shootings in a year. And some kid still is staying on the corner, knowing there's a high chance, 600 shootings, that means almost every day you could get shot, for some guy he doesn't know, for some colors, to generate to 10, 15, 20 bucks. Why is he doing that? Because he has nothing to live for, and this is what he thinks is his way out. I said, same thing overseas. You have some people who maybe a lack of education, don't know, someone just tells them, convinces them, do this, you might go to paradise. You have to look at the content and the context of the situation before we generalize and make statements. And I think that became a key factor. And that's why it's so important for us as religious ed- educators and teachers right. that we have to look at our people in the community, even in the United States, that West Coast to the East Coast to the Central Midwest, the communities are different. And we have to look at where they are and how do we inspire them to come more closer to God, yeah. right? And I think Beautiful. education is so important than ever before, and we have to realize that there are going to be different avenues for them to come and let that doors be open for them. And then, inshallah ta'ala, you know, you know, we do our best, Allah will take care of the rest. Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. That's right. I, well, I definitely appreciate, like, the fact that you're bringing, uh, emphasizing things like relationships and communication and EQ uh, to, for, for our young folks, because I, I think those are the things that, that, inshallah, will put them in the right direction. So, 
appreciate you. Appreciate this conversation. Absolutely. Where can people uh, continue to, you know, if they want to reach out, find out more about you, your books, your writings, your speaking engagement, just, just in, interact with, you know, with you in any way. Do you have a, like a website, like a repository? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, www.hqec.net. High quality, high quality educational consulting. Uh -huh. net. So okay. I'm mostly there. Um, you know, anytime with you, then stuff, anything I could do to help. Awesome. I'm glad I got to an, an education. And then what about for parents who want to learn more about Minna and supporting Minna? Yes, yeah, so MinnaMuslim.org. You know, okay. please, uh, all the information is there. Everything's online now. Things, you know, gotcha. and then we have resources so uh, for you. And, there, and, and we're trying to kind of provide online programming too now. Awesome. Well, have you? Can't thank you enough, man. It's yeah, been, it was a you know, pleasure. It's a pleasure. You know, man, I love bless the work you guys are doing. Thank you. And for everyone, I mean, everyone doing stuff, please keep us in your du'as. And and a du'a for the youth. Yes, uh, yes, yes, ours yes. and uh, every, all all. I mean, the kids. they're not even struggling. We all struggle it, right? You know. So, but it's it's good that you know. For me, I enjoy working with them because it just keeps me going. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Keep yeah. well. It keeps you young. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Would be a young shabab, right? <laughs> <laughs> My wife comes home from work exhausted. I say, hey man, at least you're work. You know, you, you know, young people keeps you young. Yeah. Keeps you on your toes. Yes. So, uh, it's definitely a skill I don't have. So anyway. Thank you so much. And uh, listeners, as always, if you want to reach out and find out more information about us or engage us in any way, please uh, email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Consider becoming a patron by going to patreon.com slash diffusecongruence. Hit us up on Facebook, Instagram. You can find us. We'll catch you on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence.